and I saw he had a meat cleaver. Holy and cow. This got real dangerous real fast. Yeah. I mean, I had milliseconds to make a decision. I think these stories show human sides of it. Right. Like, even though you've had to use your gun, even though it was a fatal incident, but we, I, I think through three hours, if someone sits through the first two hours and they hear your story, like, man, this guy is a good human. This guy is a good person. Right. And then to hear the, the hardships that you, that you've gone through, I, I think that's what we as a society needs more of these type of conversations. That's, these are some of the things that I'm, I'm trying to go towards in this podcast. Then you put it in stun where it's not the probes that shoot out. You're just straight c contact. I've been in fights with dudes under the influence and they're laughing like, ah, I can feel you tasing me. Ah, <laughs> that's just funny. Wow. And we're throwing wow. blows. And if I arrest this person who's affluent and has power and so on and so forth, they're going to come to court with lawyers. They're going to have that dream team and probably get probation. Mm -hmm. But I could go arrest this person who lives in this low income community who won't get those protections and they're just going to convict them. And I don't have to testify and things like that. So the court actually, in my opinion, it influences who we arrest mm -hmm. because I don't want to get into this legal battle with mm. the dream team <laughs> mm. when I can just make these simple arrests yeah. and get out of boys at the department. Like, yeah, you brought in that gangster for some dope. Yeah, yeah that's great. But what about the white collar criminal who just stole $80,000 from some old lady? Yeah. I would rather arrest him. Right. You know? That's the person I want. Yeah. But if I bring him into the station, it's like, Murph, what you got? This is what I got. Cool, nice. Yeah. But then I bring in a gangster who's tatted up with dope. And it's like, when we go have our, you know, our, our we call it our third briefing. It's like, Murph, what you get? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a good arrest. I'm going to go take my trainee to show him what the will look like. is available to the billions around the world on YouTube in 4K and audio streaming services like Pandora, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. If you like this content, please subscribe, like, comment, and share. And now onto the podcast. Let's jump over to law enforcement and then if we want, we'll jump back to the NFL. Yeah. So uh, how, how much time do you spend in law enforcement? So I did 14 years with Culver oh, City Police Department. Years. Yeah. And I recently retired in October. So... Mm. Yeah, but it was the best experience I had. I always wanted to be a police officer. So to be able to f fulfill that dream was, was awesome. Col Culver City is right near the 405 and the 10? Is that yeah, it's pretty much between downtown Los Angeles and Venice Beaches. Beach. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a small little... Is there still that driving range with like the 20-foot tall uh, golf guy staring at the freeway? <sighs> In Culver City? Uh, or, is that, or is that down by the Goodyear blimp? That might be further down south, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. We're trying not, to rep uh, Culver City here. Yeah, no, I'm not the <laughs> driving range in Culver City. In your okay. own, in your own word, describe what your job was like. Like, as it maybe a short, like a uh, one or two sentence description. Ooh, being a police officer is exciting. It's, it's you know, it's an adrenaline rush every day. It's full of highs and lows. Uh, I mean, it, it's hard to describe in one sentence because mm. every day mm. is different, uh, and you have so many peaks and valleys. I mean, you know. You could go through a day where you're just bored as heck. And next thing you know, your adrenaline is at the top. Mm. You're driving 90 miles per hour on the wrong side of the street. I could say that now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> getting to an emergency call because someone's life is in jeopardy. So, you know, I, I don't know if you can put that in one word. And you have to be able to, okay, now I'm there. Now I have to kind of manage all those emotions and all that adrenaline I had driving there. And you know, you're trying to deal with this situation, which might be completely volatile, dynamic and out of control. And, you know, it, it sometimes it takes a little. Uh, <laughs> your, your, is, is your instinct to tackle people and chop their knees? It, again, <laughs> every situation is different. You know, yeah. sometimes you got to meet crazy with crazy and sometimes you got to diffuse it. So you have to really ass assess the situation like within seconds, because yeah. if I don't, it's going to get out of control, you know, so. I have to be able to assess this situation within seconds, which means all your senses have to be firing. I have to listen to what's going on, 
who's the instigator, who's the victim, or who I perceive as the victim. What is this person saying? Okay, that's a keyword. Let's decompress here. Or this might be something. Okay, let's avoid this topic. And really, you're making life second or life altering decisions in seconds. Wow. Yeah. So yeah, it, it it's exciting. It's dynamic. It's volatile. It's fun. Because <laughs> you know, because nobody ever calls you when everything's fine. Yeah, you you don't get those calls. You know, it, it's. <laughs> Well, it's few and far between. I, I shouldn't say you don't get it. Culver City is a great community. Yeah. Uh, they truly support their police department. Awesome. Yeah. So holidays, they, you know, they send us food, they send us cookies, they send us gift cards or thank you cards. I shouldn't say gift cards, treats, things like that. But for the most part, and what I always tell young, younger police officers <clears throat> is you got to get out the car. You know, you can't stay in a car in order to really appreciate your community. You got to mm. talk to them. You know, otherwise they're just people yeah. or just subjects out there, you know, either a uh, criminal or potential victim or some, but you know, let's meet the people. Let's talk, let's share stories. Cause being a police officer, that's what it's about. Everyone you contact, that's an avenue of information. Excellent. So yeah. as a police officer, you know, we're only as good as the information we get because everyone knows what's going on in the community. Mm. But if you're not talking to them, then you're missing out on all that valuable information. So you know, it's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Do you think you're just, do you think your personality happened to change in the 14 years that you're in there? My personality? No, but my outlook on life. Absolutely. You know, police officers are jaded. We see things completely different. I always tell people if the four of us walk in a room together or into a party together, you're looking to have a good time. I'm looking for the asshole who might be armed? <laughs> Where's the exit? Who can I take if we get in a fight? Okay, that's going to be my first threat. Things like that. So your view is extremely jaded. Um, being retired, it's, you know, I'm still trying to get out of that mindset. You know. Did you visually check me for weapons when you? <laughs> I size every one. Yeah. It's great. So a funny story. When I first started, and you know, I was young and would go on dates with girls and things like that. When I went to their houses. As soon as I met them, got in their house, I would walk through the house to see who else is in there. Mm. And I, I didn't realize it until a girl called me. She was like, how come every time you come over here? I was like, I do that. And she was like, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, as a police officer, you got to realize every time I go somewhere, there's a gun because yeah. I brought it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Even off duty. So, yeah. So, yeah, I'm walking. I, I, it was one of those things I didn't realize till someone brought it to my attention. But, yeah. yeah every I just, house I go in, there's a gun. Yeah, that's that's good. It's a good uh, I don't know. Is that a paranoid for a normal person or is uh, that when you say normal, what you mean? A non police officer. If I'm if I'm going on a date, do I want to check to see if anybody else is in the house? I would say most people don't. That's yeah. what made it unusual to her yeah. <laughs> who brought it to my attention. But yeah. uh as a police officer, absolutely, you know, you're especially when you start working murders and things like that, gangs. Uh, you're putting people away for crimes and, you know, you're dealing with violent individuals. They might so, hold a grudge. Yeah. I've had threats in my life. I had my department buy me security cameras for my house because someone threatened to kill me. Mm. And when you're young and single, that's okay. You know, hey, you threaten me. I, I'm sure I got enough toys in my house to entertain you yeah. if you come get me. <laughs> but I have kids now. So now, you, you know, you're constantly thinking, okay, what if he comes to my house and I'm not there? Yeah, you know, my kids are there or my wife is there or grandma is there or, you know, That's they're terrible, walking home yeah. from school. So I'm going to work every day. And, you know, that plays in the back of your mind. So mm. and that, you know, a lot of those things, I, I don't know if you guys really want to get into it, but that's trauma when you're you're a police officer and that's mental health and that's with your head. Yeah. 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 And that's, you know, officer wellness. And really, when I retired, those were the issues I retired. I retired under stress. Like I've had enough of dealing with people BS. So, yeah. <laughs> so were you a regular street patrol officer? Certainly to start. And then what was your path? So for most of my career at Culver City, we kind of rotate. We do, we have assignments, but they're two or three year assignments. Uh, so I started off in patrol. I worked detectives. I worked a crime impact team, which is plain clothes, doing a lot of surveillance, executing search warrants, things like that. Mm. When I retired, I retired as a sergeant. So I ran a fair gambit of assignments at our department. Okay. Yeah. Is there a gang unit? Is that a thing or? Uh, that was more of our crime impact team, which I was on, but 
Culver City, I mean, like I said, we're a small community. We call it a sleepy town, yeah. which means, hey, during business hours, we have Sony, Amazon, Google, Apple, Nike. So you have all these large corporations within your city. Mm-hmm. And I believe our daytime population was somewhere 500,000 people going through Culver City at, you know, during the day. Wow. But at night, it's only 30, 40,000 residents. So oh, you know, okay. streets are super quiet. So we didn't have a huge gang problem. Uh, we kind of knew the gang members and yeah. where they hung out. Uh, <laughs> I seen them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, it, it wasn't, you know, there was, even though we had a gang unit, there wasn't really much call for that. Do you have street racing problems? No, no. Like I said, it's a sleepy town. Because uh, ah, I figured with all those big empty streets at night. No, it's not a lot of big empty streets. It's a residential town. Uh, okay. Re- like I said, really sleepy town. The only problem we would have as far as street racing is La Cienega, which is the big thoroughfare from LAX into Beverly Hills. And mm-hmm. so you're going to party in Beverly Hills. You're taking La Cienega and at night after hours. Yeah. Gotcha. Has some fatal accidents caused by speed and uh, things like that. So what's your thoughts on the recent, uh, within the last two years, defund the police and kind of all the issues surrounding that happened after COVID. What's your thoughts on that? So defunding police strongly Actually, against was, it. That was before it was, it started a little bit oh, before yeah, yeah. with the, um, I forget the, the guy's name in Minnesota, the, the killing of that guy. George Floyd? George Floyd, yeah. So it started with George Floyd. Uh, totally against defunding the police. It's when, if you defund them, what are you going to do with those funds? And then it's also, so the way I kind of explain it, the Western states, California, Arizona, Nevada, uh, our police department is extremely advanced when you look towards the rest of the country. Uh, we have a, what is called POLS, Police Officer Standards Training, and I think it's head and shoulders above what everything everyone else is doing. So if you're going to defund us, you're bringing that level of service down to what the rest of the country is doing uh-huh. instead of bringing them up to meet our standards. So I'm totally against it. Um, I think we need more educated police officers, more police officers who have four-year degrees, more police officers who uh, – are have a certain qualification in jujitsu or some kind of self-defense because a lot of times when i watch the shooting use of force of unarmed people i i see it like that officer was scared to go hands-on you know it's like we train so much with our weapons when shit hits the fan we're going to resort to that level of training and it's almost like you see them like well I think it's that movie Talladega Nights. What do I do with my hands? They don't know how to use their hands. You know, they don't know how to fight. And a lot of times just using hands, you know, empty, we call it empty hand tactics. You could deescalate a situation, you know, even if it, Hey, grab a dude by his hair, slam him to the, or I should take him to the ground <laughs> and cuff him, you know, but yeah, sometimes it, it just seems I'm a resort to my weapon a lot faster than they should. And, um, it results in a loss of life. So mm. I'm not against, or I am against defunding. I think we need to fund the police officers more, make sure we're hiring the right people, which are college educated people. One, cause the maturity level two, you know, the background. And when you look at the history of law enforcement guys, like, uh, I forget, I think it's August Vomer, who's considered the father of policing. They said back in what, uh, I forget what year, maybe it was early early 1900s that police officers should have four four year degrees so it's like hey if the fathers of policing are saying is uh why are we you know discrediting what they're saying that's like you know in medicine they build on what the forefathers did Mm -hmm. but we're we went the opposite way so yeah i'm totally against it let's get them more money get them educated get them trained so are you saying we want a more intelligent person Enforcing the laws instead of a knucklehead? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, Me personally, I don't want some kids straight out of high school, who, you know, especially in the Midwest where, you know, they hire them before they might send them to the police academy. Like, mm-hmm. hey, here's your badge, your gun, go out for six months until the academy class start. Wow. And now he's on training or he's in the street and he hasn't even been to an academy yet. So absolutely let's get some better educated uh, more mature mature people out there and you know let them provide customer service let them know the history of the criminal justice system you know not learn it from 
some salty cop who's <laughs> mm, yeah <laughs> who learned it from a salty cop who learned it from a salty <laughs> cop no let's let the educated professors teach these guys what the law is so what are some misconceptions you think you've learn through the 14 years kind of like maybe on the outside people might think cops are just um aggressive testosterone individuals that get in that position do you think if someone were to say that is that a completely false accusation uh just like everything else it's your perception i you know i try not to one thing i try not to do as a police officer when i watch video and people say hey what you think of that I try not to comment because I, I wasn't mm. there. I don't mm. know that person's level of training, expertise, his background, uh, what kind of trauma he's bringing to the situation. So when people say that, that might be their perception or their reality, but it's not the, you know, that's not the totality of the profession. So, you know, just don't paint everything with the, the broad stroke. Let's say my experience with the police officers, this is what it is because from, you know, my experience, nine times out of 10, it's not that. But yeah, there are people in a profession like that, just like with any other profession. Mm. Is there any misconceptions that the general masses seem to have wrong about cops? Again, it, it, it all depends on where you come from. You mm. know, for me, I grew up in a gang infested, impoverished neighborhood uh, near USC. So uh, I saw a lot of police abuse. I, you know, I saw, I believe it was 39th and Bud Long, they did a search warrant and they're throwing toilets out the second story window and breaking walls. And uh, the neighborhood I lived in, it was a predominantly Crip neighborhood. I shouldn't say predominantly, it was a Crip neighborhood. And the police officer spray painted, fuck the Harlem Crips on the window or on the walls. So, you know, that's unprofessional. So if someone in my neighborhood was to say that, absolutely, that's, that's their truth, that's their reality. But then in Culver City, me, you know, having experience working there where we provide the highest service, someone in Culver City, that wouldn't be their reality. And I'm sure it's the same in Beverly Hills and other affluent neighborhoods where, yeah. you know, that's not their reality. So you, you would never attack their toilets. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get tired of walking through some of those houses in Beverly Hills. <laughs> I've, I've done mutual aid with them and it's like, God. Damn, this is a big house. You gotta search 18 <laughs> rooms. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're walking through like this master bedroom is bigger than my apartment. So yeah, it's crazy. What's uh, your thoughts on um hiring within the community and those uh, policies with regard to hiring? So my thoughts is uh, public service should be a reflection of the community, not just policing. Uh, it should be all public service should be a reflection of the community. And that's one of the things I would like to get started out here in Vegas where you have to build those relationships. You got to have police officers come to the school, come to the youth events, get to know the public and encourage them. Hey, this is the job. It's a great job. Why don't you guys do it? Why don't you police your own neighborhood? You think about successful teams. Uh, I mean, you could go back in history, you know, tribes, civilizations or whatever it was. They didn't bring in outsiders to police them. <laughs> hmm. You police your own community. In, at night, you went and you laid your head down in your community. You knew who the drunk was. You knew who this person was, the troublemaker. So even though you had to deal with him, you knew how to deal with him. He wasn't just some asshole that this is your first contact. I don't know his history. He seemed super aggressive, even though his personality just might be loud. He's not really, you know, but when I don't know you, I'm going to take that, you know, as aggression. So when I meet your aggression with aggression, and now we have this situation that just spirals out of control and generally, it, you know, it, it never ends well or it ends with the complaint or something like that. But absolutely, I think uh, you should hire from the community. The community should be, or the police, any public service should be a reflection of the community. And, and it, it's not so much just the police department. That's where you have to start changing the hiring standards. You have to change the way HR views things or the policies they have. Uh, you know, I, I did a research paper not too long ago where we're talking about college education and things like that. But you look across the, the nation, the average black family makes $40,000. It costs, at, on average, I believe it was like $27,000 to get a college education. Well, if I only make 40, <laughs> I can't yeah. send my kid to yeah. college. So it's like, okay, but when you go to apply, it's like, hey, 
do you have any debt? The average black person is going to have debt if they went to college. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you're automatically ruled out. You know, I used to work in personnel and training, and I came across this situation where a kid had debt. I thought he was a great candidate. Uh, my supervisor brought him in, told him, hey, you got to eliminate this this debt you have. And he said, how, how am I supposed to eliminate that if I can't get a job? And he mm-hmm. was looking at me. I'm yeah. like, shit, that's a good question. I don't know mm-hmm. what to tell the dude. Mm-hmm. Oh. And, you know, it was like, and for me, it was kind of the same situation. My debt wasn't to the point where I couldn't manage it. I had to borrow money and ask relatives, hey, help me pay off this speeding ticket that I didn't pay off. <laughs> Wait, so is this, so when you go apply to be a police officer, if you have debt, you can't become a police that, officer? Is that the? That's one of the criteria, yeah. And they say because you're easily corrupted because now you want to pay this off. So you might start taking money and. Okay. I mean, you know, it, it's it's a reason. Yeah. But it is hey, we, well we have people who've passed that who didn't have debt and now they get on the force and they're taking money. So Right. <laughs> like I said, this it's those obstacles we have to where hey, this is what rules out a lot of the minority candidates. Yes. And, and it shouldn't be like that because unless you're looking at this kids or this person's financial history okay, we see he has debt, but look at his bank account. He's never had a large sum. It's not like he mismanaged his money. He just never had money, or she. Right. He or she just never had money. Whereas yeah. you look at someone who might not have debt, but you look at their financial history and they got bankruptcies and things like that in the past, yeah. but it doesn't show on that active credit report or whatever. Mm-hmm. They don't have that debt. Okay, he's a good person to hire or she's a good person yeah, to hire. But you should you would think that they should distinguish student loan debt is separate from debt is debt and you yeah. know, they look at your revolving credit accounts and the scores and yeah, yeah. It, it, it's one of those things, man. It like I said, when you're trying to get diversity and if that's your main goal, you have to re examine the hiring standards. Yeah. Now what do they consider manageable debt level? I I think to each his own. I I don't know what our department considered it. It was just, you know, like I said, even if a kid had $20,000 in debt, which is a lot. Yeah. But if it's from college, like, let it go. Yeah. (laughs) Like he said, how am I supposed to pay it off if I can't get a job? If these are the higher standards across the board, you know, this kid's never going to work in public service. Yeah. Well, we all know that, uh, you know, 20 grand in college debt is an investment. In some way, I mean, at least you're thinking it's an investment versus a a shopping spree. And I I think, you know, that that pendulum is starting to swing towards that with, you know, they're asking for debt forgiveness. But, you know, so I I would I was doing that six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And back then, no one was asking about college forgiveness loans and and things like that. When I got hired, you know, it it wasn't a even a topic. So, yeah. But fortunately for me, I had a scholarship. I didn't have to deal with that stuff. But yeah, I, I've seen it working in the, the profession and I've seen good kids just, they can't do it. You know? Yeah. I thought he or she might've been a good hire, but because of that hiring standard, they never got into, or they didn't join our department. I, I shouldn't say they, they didn't get into the profession. Now, how involved were you in the hiring process or? So one of my assignments in personnel and training, um, I was very involved. I mostly did background checks and things like that. The ultimate decision never rested with me. I was just out recruiting. I did a lot of Black College Expo. I did a lot of going to the junior colleges and speaking to that crowd, trying to get them into the profession because I believe in diversity in law enforcement and public service in general. So I took it upon myself to, hey, let's go talk to these kids. Let's go talk to the kids at West LA and Santa Monica and the Black College Expo. You know, I would ask my department if I could do that. Like, I'll do it for free, even though it's my off day. Uh-huh. Uh, I, don't, I don't care about overtime. It was just, I want to go out, get these kids to. Wait, are you trying to get Asians to be cops too? Hey, if, if they want to be, you guys have, <laughs> <laughs> have your own community. Absolutely. You no, know, if you get Asians to want to be cops, then we're going to be short on pharmacists. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's there's enough for you guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it, actually, I, I would go down to Golden West, which is, I forget, near Irvine, I believe. Yeah, and down there, yeah, Orange County. Exactly. Yeah. And large Asian community down there. So, yeah, it was one of those things like, hey, let's just go out, talk to people. Like I said, I, I loved doing a Black College Expo. It was a unique event. Uh, 
get to meet a lot of kids and there's actually a lot of diversity. It's just called the Black College yeah, Whatever, Expo. Sergeant Terry. I'm going to go play football. <laughs> Do that, too. <laughs> That's what I did. That was my route. So, yeah, yeah, it, it, it was a great experience. And, yeah, so I was very involved in it. Uh, but like I said, the final say never rested with me, nor should have at my pay grade. But, yeah. What were some of the great things and the bad things in the law enforcement? Like, either systematically that you saw there – things that are not set up well for the what's the word I'm looking for for cops to do their job correctly or morally and then what are things that are set up real well for that uh there's pros and cons on pretty much everything uh so policing is based a lot on tradition and depending on who you ask policing may have started from the slave patrol it may have started from you know, uh, the, the guy Vomer and uh, at Berkeley. It, it so it, you believe it started from slave patrol. Let's say, then a lot of those traditions that were passed down. Hey, they're they're you know they're being taught. And I'll give you a good example. Well, one that hit me um, in Culver City. We had something called the Culver City Escort, where I see a car, I want to stop. It just doesn't look right, but I don't have a reason to stop it. Uh, so. I would just get behind them, follow them. Culver City is only four and a half square miles. So I will follow them and pretty soon they'll make a left or right and they're out of Culver City. That's mm. a Culver, it's Culver City escort. It's almost like crime prevention. Hey, my presence, you know, whether they were good or bad, nothing happened. They left the city. Mm. Great. That's what we want. So as I'm doing research, I'm working on my <laughs> that's, master's that's degree. That's problem. Right, now. right. I'm, I'm working on my master's degree, and I'm doing research on the history of Culver City, and the first cotton club was in Culver City. Back then, I believe it was 1920s, Culver City was considered a KKK town. What, what's mm. a cotton club? It was like a famous jazz club for black musicians, but oh. white people went. So they're at the cotton club, and I, I'm reading an article about the black musicians saying, hey, after their sets, they didn't want to go outside to smoke a cigarette because the police would harass them. Because mm. you know, so now they're put in this small little corner inside the Cotton Club, smoke a cigarette. It was super uncomfortable. Then after their show was done, uh, the police would be waiting for them to escort them back to their side of town, which mm. was Central Avenue, and it was called the Culver City Escort. Right. So that tradition that I had participated in had been passed down for all those generations. Yeah. And unknowingly, I was doing the very same thing that they were doing to my ancestors or my community yeah. in 1920, you know, mm. which was a racist tradition. Let's get these people out of Culver City. Yeah. Uh, so when I read that, it was like one of those things like, damn, my heart sank. I had to call my aunt, you know, that aunt that's, oh, baby, it's okay. Everything, <laughs> you didn't know. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, but when I read it, I called her and I told her and she told me that and it was, you know, and that was my realization, like, hey, these are traditions that have been passed down and taught to me. And and that's when you talk about culture and tradition in law enforcement, that's one of the bad things. You know, it's we we you come out the academy and you're assigned to training officer, but that training officer was taught by a training officer and that training. Mm -hmm. So that's how so that's one of the bad things. Uh, so so do you like jazz? I love jazz, actually. <laughs> I do. It wasn't jazz that was the problem. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> We're looking for jazz musicians yeah, rolling no, through. No, no, I love jazz. Wasn't the problem in that. Uh, one of the good things it's just community service. You're, you know, yeah. it's policing. We we say it's one of those things you're called to do, and I truly believe that. You know, no one wants to put on a uniform, be the target of all this vitriol and hate and. Mm -hmm. but go out and still serve their community and make a difference unless it's something you're truly passionate about. And it was one of those things I was truly passionate about. And I believe we have to do a better job of finding those people. Cause now with the economy and things like that, we have people who just want to be a police officer to get a check mm -hmm. and they go into that profession with the wrong attitude. And now they're dealing with all this stress and they don't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, it results in those use of forces and things like that because they weren't equipped properly to handle the job and things like that. So, hey, can we rewind a little bit? So, in the in the Cotton Club days, they were targeting black musicians, saying, "Hey, get the fuck out of here!" Right? Mm -hmm. 
So when you were doing the Culver City Escort, we're in the 2000s now, right? Mm-hmm. What what would you see? What kind of car or what kind of individual would you say, you know, I'm, I'm going to see if the, what this person's doing. I'm going to escort them. I'm you gonna- know, it, it, it's not anything specific. As a police officer, you're just looking for, I guess, little traits or things like the way someone looks at you, you know, it's or look away from you if they're trying to avoid contact. Mm-hmm. We call it criminal profiling. It's not racial profiling when you're doing it the right way. Yeah. You're, um, believe it or not, uh, gang tattoos, prison tattoos, the way a person carries himself. If he sees you, does he reach for his hip? Mm-hmm. Just, hey, cause, or his pockets. Because to me, that's a sign like there's something there. Yeah. And who, what, what would you have on your hip that you got to make sure that it's concealed <laughs> or in your pocket? <laughs> I, oh man, I shouldn't be giving away trade secrets right now. <laughs> <laughs> you lured me into that one. I started. I just got to know what not to do. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it's those things you look for, like, hey, those are traits of a criminal. Does it? Yeah. It's not, you know, nothing's 100% accurate. Yeah. But hey, if I see it, eh, I might want to talk to this person. Right. So I, I'll look for those things, you know, maybe four individuals in a car tattoos on their face like uh normal you know people don't really have tattoos on their face face the, tats is a giveaway yeah <laughs> the, <laughs> things like that doesn't make them a bad guy or a criminal it's just uh, that's that's interesting <laughs> probably not a doctor <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> exactly so and so it's just a little like i said doesn't make them a criminal just yeah. hey maybe that's the one i want to talk to you know, and that's kind of our job. Like I said, you have to develop race relationships. Yeah. You have to communicate because every time I don't talk to someone and I had that opportunity, then I just bypass a source or avenue of information. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a lot of maybe that's one of the misconceptions. Every contact is an enforcement contact, at least not for me. Yeah. Sometimes I just want to say hi to people. Hey, how you doing? What you doing in the neighborhood? What you're doing on the street? Oh, you live here. That's cool. How long you been here? Just have a conversation. Cool, yeah. man. Enjoy your day. That's all it is. You know, just like any other person would be on the street. Yeah. I, so I, I think for most people, there's a uh, a certain fear of police officers, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which is weird to me because so on an ideal level, we say, hey, these are the people we entrust to enforce our laws. Right. We give them we give them power. We give them guns. We give them the ability to arrest and all of these privileges to help us have an orderly society. Mm-hmm. So if I'm not doing anything wrong. I shouldn't be afraid of any police officer. If I'm following the rules, I'm not doing anything crazy. I shouldn't, shouldn't be worried at all. Right. Mm -hmm. But then I see like my girlfriend is the nicest, sweetest, most rule following law abiding person on earth. She wouldn't, she, she she would, doesn't, it makes her crazy and nervous to, to even think about breaking a rule that wouldn't even matter. Mm -hmm. So she by nature is never going to be breaking a law intentionally. Right. And yet even, even her out on the street, she has a certain kind of wariness of like, oh shit, there's a cop, look out, right? Mm -hmm. So is there this subconscious thing where we think there's this potential for police officers to step you on their role or to, to bring some, some, some terror into our lives, uh, unjustly? Is there some, I'm I'm trying to understand the psychology of it because this is a person who shouldn't be afraid of police officers at all. Right. Right. She's the goodest person. So she should love police officers, but why do we have this fear that, oh, some asshole cop is going to shake me down or give me a hard time about something that I wasn't even, you know, turn a traffic, you know, is, is my traffic mistake going to turn into, you know, getting beat up and arrested and thrown in jail? Mm-hmm. You know, is a very vague, strange thing where I think, I, I just wanted your opinion on that because from the, from the civilian side, this seems to be more of that than there should be to me. So my answer to that, and it's my opinion. Yeah, sorry <laughs> for the know, complex no, no, question. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know if people will agree with it or not, but yeah. it's what you're taught. I mean, I still, if a police officer gets behind me, I get nervous. And mm. I'm a police officer or a retired police officer, but it was that all that trauma from growing up. Mm-hmm. It never ended well. So, and it's the same thing with people today. How many times on YouTube have you seen a police officer do a great job? Yeah, They don't show those videos. Yeah. They show the videos of the shootings, the use of force. So when your girlfriend sees that, yeah. that's her perception because that's what she's been taught about police officer. And it's being reinforced on a daily or constant basis by the media, her friends, you know, they're sharing these videos. Mm-hmm. So 
when I see that <laughs> uniform, that uniform represents that video I just saw. That's my perception. That's my reality now mm. because I haven't had those positive non-enforcement contacts. Yeah. I haven't met a good police officer because I don't get contacted by them. Uh, so my only experience with the police officer is when I see this guy or when I see the video. And now that I am contacted by a police officer, which probably means you did something wrong, yeah. he's going to give me a ticket. So those videos were true, right? That's, uh, that's yeah. what we start to believe, you know? So uh, it's, it's what we're being taught. It's what's being reinforced. Uh, it's not the reality. Yeah. Uh, I would say speaking from my experience throughout the day and keep in mind Culver city, it was a, again, it, it's a small community. It's not, you know, very active like LAPD. So we had a lot of downtime where we can go out and be proactive and look for criminals and stop people for traffic violations. Right. So let's say I stop, I don't know, 13 cars in a day. Maybe yeah. only one or two will get a ticket. The other, I'm just educating. I don't want to give people tickets. I just want to say, hey, next time, stop at the stop sign. You saw me there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Right? Well, so right? I, That's, I just want to have, hey, yeah. next time, stop. I, I've told people, hey, this is what you've done. I'm going to sit here with you for the next five minutes so everyone driving by thinks you got a ticket and I'm enforcing that rule <laughs> that they saw you violate. Yeah. But in actuality, I'm going to let you go. Oh you are, I, yeah, you are yeah. the police officer I wish every police officer was. <laughs> but that should be every police officer, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, Unless you're, you know, do you, under the influence or doing right. something egregious, we have a lot of no, discretion. Well, so, so our perception, at least here in Vegas, and in, you know, I used to live in San Diego and stuff, uh, in the places I've been, the general perception is these cops are out to get us. They they got a quota. They got to write so many tickets to get funding for the city. It's a revenue collection thing. Mm -hmm. um, like I could be, you know, barely doing anything wrong, and they're trying to they're they're hiding out trying to get me. And then the, no matter what I do, they're going to give me a ticket, mm -hmm. even if, even if I have a good reason. Like hey, the you know the traffic cones was messed up, mm -hmm. and I was just trying to follow the rules, but the cones were unclear. But now you're going to give me a double fines construction ticket anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's been my experience, my perception. And the only time I hear about people getting a warning instead of uh, a ticket is when they're a really pretty girl. So, <laughs> yeah. so that's, <laughs> uh, I would say from the public, that's more the perception. Like, I wish it was like you're saying, where if uh, an officer sees you make a mistake, they're here to help you and, and remind you to be a better driver. That would be great. But our perception is that, fuck, I'm going to get a ticket. You know, I'm, I'm getting nailed. I'm out. I'm out. I'm looking at... I got to watch my ass is what I'm so and traffic officers are probably get mad at me. But <laughs> if you get stopped by a traffic cop, uh -huh. you're getting a ticket. That's their job. Their job is to enforce the rules of the road. So there's a separate role. Yeah, for, there's okay. traffic division. There's patrol. If you get stopped by a patrol officer, someone who's just looking to take people to jail, which they yeah. prevent crime. You know, I don't give a shit about a ticket. Okay. I want to take a bad guy to jail. That's my job. Yeah. And not just some, you know, eh, wobbler. Maybe this is a, no, I want to take bad people to jail. Okay. That's my job. So if I stop you, we talk, you're a good guy. Go, man. I'm not, you're, you're not what I'm looking for. Yeah. But if you get stopped by a traffic cop, you're getting a ticket because that's their job. Their job is so, you know, whether you like it or not, if they're writing 30, 40 tickets a day, then that person is very good at their job. Mm. So, yeah, but you know, that's their, that's their role. So if they're not giving people a break, good for them. Because yeah. that's not what they're supposed to be doing. Whereas you you take patrol, I could care. If I'm in patrol, I could give a shit about a stop sign violation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stop you for it. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you about it. But I don't want to go to traffic court for that. Yeah. I, you know, that's a day away from patrol. That's a day away uh, from me doing what I want to do. You know, yeah. that's four hours sitting in some traffic court waiting for this ticket to be called just so you could... Say, okay, yeah, I agree to pay the $65 fine. Right. Right? <laughs> right? Yeah. Where a traffic cop, they have days where, hey, I'm going to spend my day in court this day, and I'm going to fight all 17 tickets. Yeah. You, you know, so. You know, you know, that's another thing I see is, uh, you know, I lived in Las Vegas for 11, 12 years. I lived in the Southwest, most of that. And so most of the time you have a regular level of, you know, police officers you'll see around. Mm -hmm. And then on whatever, like, you know, January 27th, they're all out and you see a ton of people getting tickets on the same day. Is there something to that pattern where like, man, I wasn't seeing people pulled over, but today I'm seeing everybody getting pulled over. seems like the whole force is out. Uh, there could be, and it could be a result of you guys. You guys maybe yeah. could have called in and said, Hey, 
they're racing down whatever street this is all day or between yeah. two and four. Yeah. So now that you call, we have to do something about it. So now you see the whole department out there writing tickets and you're like, oh, look, now they're being assholes writing tickets yeah, all coming day. after us. Right. <laughs> but no, usually if you see something like that, it's a result of public, the public complaining about an issue. Oh, it, it happens okay. a lot near schools. Like, hey, these people are flying through the school district at 3 p.m. when the kids are getting out. Yeah. So as a, a sergeant, I want to remedy that situation. Hey, you four guys go out there and just write tickets if between three and four. That's what you're going to do. Gotcha. And now you see it and you're like, oh, look, they're just writing tickets. <laughs> yeah. But that's the backstory behind it. Okay. There was complaints about this area. Maybe it was speed related or maybe yeah. the bar lets out at 2 a.m. And a lot of people are driving home drunk, whatever the case may be. Yeah. When we're reacting to that, those complaints. So. That's the, great. I'm so glad yeah. I asked you. So, yeah, that might be a situation where things like that happen. I had I have a uh, statement someone told me, and I just want to ask you if it's true or not. Um, they said, I don't, I, they weren't even a cop. I don't know where they heard this oh, from. Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they said part of the police academy training trains the cops to deal with the worst of society because you, like, uh, during that training, you're looking for gangsters. You're looking for uh, serial killers. You're looking for traces of criminal activity in a person. Um, during that police academy that, that really, um, they, this person said it really trains the cop to be on edge all the time because they're these videos that you're in training is showing the worst of society. And then also on top of that, this person said, I think the, they said something like the first year or the first years of a police officer's life in, in that career, uh, the, usually the, the department will put them in the harshest location. So not only did they go schooling with the harshest dealing with the harshest people or the it's the training scenarios yeah the harshest scenarios yeah mm -hmm. and then did you get into the real world and the first years are dealing with the harshest areas which would be probably the harshest people maybe mm -hmm. so then this person was saying yeah we're we're training these cops to deal with people like like uh <clears throat> they're already bad people like they're already criminals but the problem with that whole training is it's not showing cops Hey, there should be a like a, a more um, dealing with people as just people too, mm -hmm. um, or it's it's just putting them the cops on edge so early. So, is there any truth on that? I would say yes, uh, not necessarily the way you phrased it, but if I have to train you to be a good person, then you probably shouldn't be a police officer. That's yeah. just the, yeah. <laughs> that, that's just it. You know, if I have to train you to have conversations with people in your community then you probably shouldn't be a police officer. So yes, I am going to train you for the worst because every call you go to, every traffic violation, every time you contact someone, there's a gun. I know because I brought it. Mm -hmm. So if I get in a fight with you, we're fighting over a gun. Every police officer who gets in a fight, they're fighting over a gun. That's got to be my mentality because if mm -hmm. I'm not thinking that, what's the penalty? Death for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I got a family I want to go home to. So Every time I'm in a street fight, we're fighting over a gun. Uh, yeah, there might be an instance where I can really determine, okay, this person isn't fighting to kick my ass. He's just fighting to get away. Mm -hmm. So even though my force is still going to be to, to subdue him, I, you know, I have that wherewithal to control, okay, now let's just try to get his arms behind his back or pin him down till my backup comes. But when these things start to escalate, my first thought is, if he hits me or if I hit him, we're in this, we're in this because I got to protect this thing on my hip. And we train, well, I shouldn't say we, police officers should be training to fight with this thing on their gun, to have weapon retention. Not all of us do that. Uh -oh. And to me, that should be a mandate. You know, we're required to qualify on a range. I think it's like once every two months or something like that well shit we should be in a mat room qualifying showing a proficiency level of gun retention every two months or every month because we're going to use our hands more than we ever will use our gun 14 uh, years of my career i've only used my weapon once but oh my god i probably use my hands every day for mm -hmm. shit if it was a 10-hour shift I'm using my hands. I'm contacting someone, patting someone down eight hours of that 10 hour day. So I need to know how to use my hands. Uh, so yeah, I would say there's some truth in that, but,
but only because it's officer survival. Um, as a rookie, I do want to get you into a lot of crap, a lot of shit. So that way it's experience. Uh, you know, the first time you get into a car pursuit, uh, foot pursuit, it's going to be overwhelming. But now that you've done it three or four times and you're two years in, you're, you're much more calm. You can handle it better. So I would rather get you into the shit your first <laughs> yeah, year yeah, yeah. than have you six years down the road and this is the first time it happened. And now you're uh, spiraling out of control when you should be a seasoned veteran. So, yeah, I would say there's some truth to that, but, but no, for good reason. Under those circumstances, no, you're working with someone that's seasoned with you, right? You're not a rookie going out with another rookie. Like you're going to be working with someone, a seasoned sergeant, or well, may not be a sergeant, but someone that has more years under their yeah, belt. Yeah, you know, like that uh, Denzel Washington movie. Yeah, training day. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're going to be working with a training officer. And, you know, as a TO, my job is to expose you to as much, as much stuff as possible. So that way you have the experience of, uh, when you get called into court, I don't want it to be, hey, that you're, you know, four years on, this is my first time in court testifying on a drug case or a foot pursuit or, you know, why I had to use force and, you know, trying to recite policy. I, I want you to be experienced. So when I'm done training you and I sign off, this person is good to go. He or she is really good to go because I've exposed them to as much as I can. And don't get me wrong, I can't expose them to everything. Policing is a evolving dynamic profession 14 years in i was still learning things because you just can't cover everything but i want to give you a solid foundation to build on as a training officer yes yeah, so i'm hearing a call for more hand-to-hand -hand training and more gun retention training for officers is that a absolutely so absolutely. you propose every two months you have a hey we gotta you gotta you gotta hit the mat you gotta do some jujitsu i prefer propose in order to be hired when you come out of the academy you have to have a certain proficiency level yeah i'm not a jujitsu guy so i don't know the belts and all that stuff yeah uh, but if it's a standard of purple belt then you got to achieve that in order to go to an eight in order to go mm -hmm. outside on patrol i think and not so much jujitsu i don't want to say like jujitsu is the end all be all but some sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat open hand combat where okay this person can box at a great level or yeah. Muay Thai or whatever it is, but it can't just be all I do is shoot my gun and go 10-8 and I've never been in a fight. And the first time I get in a fight is with this 6'4", 280 pound convict who yeah. has done up downs and burpees for eight years in jail <laughs> and he's sweaty and I'm trying to grab his arm and I can't. So boom, I'm gonna shoot him. No, yeah. that can't be your first fight. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, Today, with the popularity of MMA and UFC, we have some significant portion of the population of, yeah. of males, certainly, that have some MMA training now, right? Just yeah. even going to the gym and having fun. Absolutely. You know, those anybody that spent a couple days on the mat is now Absolutely. more advanced than the average person. Absolutely. And as a training officer, you know, going back to training officers, that's one of the things you teach your trainee. Like, hey, when you stop a guy and you see this do uh gracie jujitsu and i say gracie because i love gracie those those guys are freaking <laughs> awesome man. uh and you see that sticker on his rear shield rear windshield yeah you better know this dude is a threat uh if you stop someone and you get them out the car and they got the cauliflower ears uh. you better know <laughs> <laughs> this dude might be able to kick your ass so hey man what's wrong with your ear yeah yeah i, I you know Can you hear me <laughs> right i gotta train an ulcer for that so just contacting those individuals they already got a leg up on you so, and when you see it, you better start formulating the game plan. Okay, how am I going to take this person down? How am I going to subdue him? Uh, should I get back up rolling now as opposed to when he punched me? <laughs> you got to stay out of their striking reach. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, it's, it's just officer safety stuff. Like, hey, yeah. I, maybe I keep him in his car contained until I get another unit here. I don't get him out. Or whatever it is, you got to start formulating the game plan when you see those indicators that this, this might be a badass dude. Dude, I would, I would love to see a officer gun retention training day where you bring in normal dudes like us. Like, okay, the game is I'm going to try to get your gun. Yeah. <laughs> you you got to get the cuffs on me don't before I get you. And, and honestly, and I'm not shitting on the profession, but you don't even have to bring in normal dudes. Just some yeah. police officers. They are just equipped yeah. as you are. Yeah. Because they haven't practiced it, you know. So their mechanics. Right, here comes be, Barney. Yeah. Their <laughs> mechanics will be just as clumsy as yours will be because they, they haven't practiced. And just like anything else, it takes repetition. Yeah. You know, 
we do post does require us to meet this qualification or certification every two years of um i forget what is arrest control tactics mm -hmm. every two years by the time i leave that class i forgot what i was taught <laughs> so when i go to it in two years it's yeah. like i'm learning all over again because i didn't practice in between right so i'm the same like, way with chemistry yeah exactly <laughs> so like equations I said, in a while it, it should be a month month to month maybe bi-monthly whatever it is but it has to be more self-defense open hand tactics training in law enforcement mm -hmm. now what is the uh, the prevalence of tasers and your thoughts on taser use or oh i could say this because i no longer have to carry one but those things are trash mm. just absolute garbage they unreliable I, or uh, uh or doesn't necessarily no, the, stop the, somebody it, it to me it's 50 50. i mean a lot of it depends on clothing that sweatshirt or thick oh. jacket it's not penetrating so i've just wasted five seconds of a good chance where i could have controlled you relying on this thing that's not going to work i then oh. you put it in stun where it's not the probes that shoot out you're just straight c contact i've been in fights with dudes under the influence and they're laughing like ah i can feel you tasing me ah, <laughs> that's just funny wow. and Damn. we're throwing wow. blows and it, it doesn't so yeah. it's like now you throw it away but then you just threw a weapon away so now it's, it's yeah. just tasers yeah. are dumb Wow. Okay. <laughs> In my about, opinion. Yeah. yeah, I never thought about sweatshirts and hoodies blocking a taser. Yeah, if it's, it, the probe doesn't penetrate, it's ineffective. And now you have this thing in your hand, and now I got to worry about reholstering, or it's just. So yeah. ideally, you want the uh, shirtless guy with the sword. Ideally, you don't want tasers. <laughs> no. I, okay. And again, this is my opinion. Ideally, you, won't, you don't want tasers. It's just that false sense of protection, I guess, mm. that, okay, the. The community says, well, why you didn't tase them? You yeah. know, because they think it's an effective weapon. But, yeah. you know, police officers, we know it's trash. Oh. So, but we have to carry it. We have to show that we try to use it if we, when we go to court or you're in a use of force situation. And reality is I would never use, I rely on my hands and, yeah. it, you know, I get my ass kicked, I get my ass kicked, but I would rather get my ass kicked than try to use a taser on a combative suspect. Wow, yeah. Do you ever see those uh, shotgun shells where the taser is loaded into the shotgun shell and the whole thing? I haven't seen those. No. Okay. No, I've seen beanbags, which are effective. Some, some, bean they hurt. Yeah, they, they hurt. They make you, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have that shot. small window to go hands on. And like a lot of those, you know, weapons, you still have to go hands on. You know, yeah. if I hit you with a beanbag and you fall, I still got to go hands on at some point to put you in cuffs. So. Mm. That's yeah. why training hands on to me is is paramount for the future of law enforcement. So really, we need to combine MMA with police officering. Absolutely, and education. Well, because kids want to be Conor McGregor, right? Kids want to be, uh, you know, the Korean zombie. I I I don't know that. For me, but how cool would that be that we combine the two to where police officers are ultimate badasses? Well, I mean. Oh, but you, you want to have that education component with it. Well, you, you talk yeah. about kids and yeah. we look up to warriors and samurais and things like that. Yeah. Well, that's what you're training a police officer to be. You know, right. you're teaching him not to just rely on his gun. I'm going to train you to be a warrior. I'm yeah. going to train you to be a samurai or some sort of superhero type person who's qualified to use more than just his weapon. Yes. He's qualified to use his hands. He's qualified to de-escalate de-escalate a situation because he has an education he's intelligent you know, exactly he can go speak someone down off the cliff or you know when someone's in a mental crisis i know he can go talk to this person for three hours yeah. and talk them down as opposed to this person who's never even been in a situation like this because he wasn't trained he wasn't educated yeah. I, I know we're stereotyping towards male because there is that physical component right is yeah, what what percentage of the force are there a lot of females in police officering? Is it 10%? Is it Again, there needs to be more diversity in policing. I, yeah. If I say he or she is, or he a lot, it's just because my vernacular, what I'm comfortable with. Well, most but, most but police officers there's are. There's absolutely a need for females in the profession. Uh, yeah. Like I said, it's not that everything is combative. It's, hey, how can I diffuse the situation? Mm. You know, because what I ultimately want, I want cooperation. I don't want to fight you. I don't want to have to use force against you. I want to co-op. I want you to cooperate with my commands so I can 
either handcuffed you or whatever. So if a female is better at that, then great. She's she's golden for this job because that's yeah. what I want. I want the cooperation. That's the ultimate goal of a police <laughs> officer is to get cooperation and get this person to do what you're asking them to do. That reminds me of, uh, I did a podcast with a um, retired prison guard mm -hmm. and he said the female prison guards, they see that the inmates listen to the female prison guards more than the male prison mm -hmm. guards. So uh, when you're saying if, if there's more diversity, more females in the, as a police officer, mm -hmm. that might help uh, right. get people to comply. Yeah. But I think if I'm in a confrontational situation and I've never been there, I, Liam, get your fucking hands on the ground. Yeah. Where a female <laughs> might be like, sir, calm down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, her, uh -huh, she's, uh -huh. she's coming from a whole different perspective, different approach. And it might, uh, she might el elicit that cooperation. So, you know, in it, we just need more diversity yeah, in policing. Yeah. yeah, it was, um, I think it was an interview on NPR. It was a female officer. She was talking about, um, she was saying, and now we're speaking in general um, generalization, but she was saying men naturally tend to revert to that aggressive She's saying male police officers or women will look to try to de-escalate and talk, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. have a conversation with you first mm -hmm. and try to view you as a human being first and then, you know, escalate to the level of where you are. Try to stay, yeah. keep it at that level where men have a tendency yeah, talk to talk to the mic. Yeah. Oh, sorry. If you want, try to swing the mic. Yeah, yeah, hard. In front of you. It, um, you could try to move the stand yeah. to the front. Of the yeah. Frame. yeah, there you go. There you go. Where they were saying, uh, you know, women may have more of a tendency to have a conversation and talk to you first where men is naturally... Are you, are you saying a female officer approaches differently or are you saying men well, react to female well, officers differently? No, they were saying that uh, um, she, her, her first thought was to have a conversation to talk to you mm. first. Where they're saying men, male officers have a tendency to be more aggressive and mm. bringing that testosterone and that energy, yeah. you know. And obviously, I don't want to make generalizations, but she was saying she typically female officers, they look to de-escalate and have a conversation. And, and as yeah. the situation escalates, they will escalate, mm -hmm. you know. So mm. it, uh, to me, a, a lot of that goes back to training. Uh, it's what you're teaching your officer. So again, training, tradition, culture. If the culture says, hey, I'm going to teach you how I was taught. And if this person is mouthing off, you better go hands on right now. And so if a guy doesn't do that, oh, in the locker room, he's soft. No, he, he can't do this job. No. Uh. But the female does it. She might. Be considered soft and even females sometimes you know they have to go through that phase where they have to show like hey they can do the job because that's what we want to see but for a male he's quickly labeled oh he's soft he was scared to go hands on even though the outcome might have been what we wanted yeah he didn't react the way we were taught to react mm. so yeah he, he'll get that label and wow it's a whole nother dynamic we gotta yeah, do yeah, yeah. It's, it, it, it's i mean it's it's an alpha male profession and <laughs> believe it or not and you know I, I hate to say it there's a lot of guys in a profession who want to be alpha males but they're not mm. but they got to act like alpha males because they're around alpha males mm. and you know you're you're trying to be something you're not and I, I read it somewhere the other day like it takes a lot of courage to be who you are yeah. so when you have a guy who's not <laughs> alpha male and he's just afraid to be him because yeah they're not going to see him as a good fit then yeah he's going to be something he's not instead of being true to self and you know there's more than a thousand ways to skin a cat or more than one way to skin a cat mm. he might be able to do the job he might do it effectively but because culture tradition said this is how you do it mm. he has to buy into that well, so so part of our public perception is that uh some officers are there because they're on a power trip is that we, we have this perception there's this there's this guy that's a dick and he wants to be a dick and he goes and be a cop because now he has some authority you know there's there's kind of that in the public perception is that do you find that to be somewhat realistic or totally off that's absolutely 100 percent true there's doctors who are dicks and on power trips there's lawyers who are dicks and on power trips there's yeah. you know engineers and you know hey i built this or my dad was this and so that's true to every profession. I hate when people just make it a singular thing, like it's only police officers this way. Mm. But no, if you know. Thank you. Hell, they said the guy. I guess the difference is, is that then we feel like, well, then now this person has a legitimate position to have some authority over us. Whereas if an engineer is a dick, well, what do I care? I'm not dealing with any engineers. 
right but, but i'm just yeah. saying people are people yeah, yeah. <laughs> so but no i i agree with what you're saying and that's yeah. why i feel like hey there needs to be this education involved yeah um because we're entrusted with a lot of power man we have the power to take away someone's freedom we have the power to use deadly force mm-hmm. and when you're hiring a kid out of high school who's never been for me and i don't know about you guys but college was the most diverse place i had ever been Mm. And, you know, it's not like it's forced on you. It's just there. You're yeah. away from your environment. You're, you're not at home. You're in this just melting pot of ideas and people just from Indian dudes walking yeah, around. Yeah, just and different backgrounds. And you're in class and you're surrounded by different cultures. And because, you know, it's that guy even though with you're the guitar in, and the tie dye exactly, shirt. Exactly. <laughs> even though you're in a diverse place, there's still kind of clickish, you know, everyone still kind of associates with their own. Yeah. And when you start intermingling with these groups, there's a lot of understanding that goes on. So now as a police officer, when I do go to that Indian community, I, I dealt mm-hmm. with them in college. I know he's not being offensive. I, I or I'll, I'll say it about Middle Eastern because, mm. you know, they tend to be loud and pompous. Yeah. But because I dealt with them in college. I'm not offended by him getting in my face. That's just how they are. They like mm. to be loud and brash and I don't take offense to it. It's just like, okay, how can I diffuse this? You come over here and talk to me. The rest of you guys stay there. Yeah. And you know, cause a lot of times it's just a show. It's just, they're doing it for show. But now when I isolate them, we can be civilized mm, Yeah. And instead of me being offended and, you know, going at them or being just as aggressive, meeting his hostility with hostility. Yeah. Come here, dude, let's talk right you're changing so, the dynamic of exactly not having an audience so yeah so i you know again it goes back to education i i'm a huge proponent of that four-year degree just so you can be around mm-hmm. uh other cultures i guess be in that diverse environment so when you do come out because let's say hey there's some kid who grew up in the midwest in a small town where i'm sure they all look alike yeah but now he gets hired by the big department and he's going to work in, you know, the the black community. Yeah. And all he's ever seen is rap videos and, yeah. you know, whatever. Well, that's his perception, you know. And I can't tell him he's wrong because that's all he's he knows. Are you saying rap videos are not a good representation of black America? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> I, I I'm saying there's more to us than rap videos. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> everyone doesn't want to aspire to that, you know, rap lifestyle. So, but when that's all you know, or I, that's I all you, you came see, to Vegas to pop champagne at the clubs. Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely did. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's built on success. So nice. Yeah, absolutely. If you work hard, you should party hard. Yeah. I joke about that, but I love everything Terry is saying so far. He's, proposing some brilliant changes to make our policing better uh you know i i think everything you said made a whole lot of sense so far thank you yeah it's, it's great to hear i, I agree yeah. um, i'm and, passionate about it man it was my my life what i aspire to do in your career in law enforcement what are some memories that uh that you're proud of oh well first thing is is solving murders i've been a part i wasn't a homicide detective but i was a part of a team who we saw two murders within cover city and cover city doesn't have a lot we probably have a murder once every three years Mm -hmm. Uh, so to be a part of that and get the bad guy in custody and you know i was on a team where we actually apprehended the guy and it was actually both guys um that's that's what you're in it for uh i tell a story so when i was on I was actually in the academy and when you're in the academy you have to go back to your department and do a ride along so i'm not a police officer i'm just a recruit at this point on my ride along uh a murder was committed so you know ultimately we respond and bad guys and actually let's back up i don't want to share that <laughs> but oh, you know I it, that it, it, yeah that was that was a that was a great day because my ride along it was like murder and shooting and for cover city it was like the worst day possible for a ride along it was like i didn't want to go home but that's what i signed up yeah. for <laughs> yeah no there was a day uh and i was a police officer and uh maybe two years on and early morning 7 a.m we got a call of a man down parent got gunshot wounds at a construction site mm. 
So we respond, enter the construction site, he's dead, and, and I'm a patrol officer, and we secure the scene, so on and so forth. Uh, about two years later, I'm on a team, and we're working this case. So, and, you know, we're doing wiretaps and things like that, and ultimately we get the bad guy in jail. So to see that come full circle from being, a, I think I was the second officer on scene at wow. a murder, to arresting this guy who committed the murder, mm -hmm. it was just probably the most rewarding thing I've done in law enforcement. Wow. wow. Was it was it the fighting over a lunch or something or what uh, happened? No, no. I, I, I respect the dead. I, I don't <laughs> make oh, tell the story. Yeah. The, no, it was just a robber gone wrong. He was a oh. con construction foreman. Someone was trying to rob the place for copper pipes and he surprised him oh, and they wow. shot him. Mm. Yeah. So very tragic event and that's terrible. It was unfortunate and it was terrible. That's why I'm so proud to have been a part of that case. Now, as a, um, a product of LA, how did Rodney King impact your um, impact you, and and your thoughts on policing going forward? Because I, I would imagine Rodney King happened prior to you joining the force, right? Yeah, Rodney King happened when I was in high school. I'm not that old, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't remember. I can't remember what year it was. No, I was yeah, already yeah, 20 yeah, years yeah, okay, old okay. at that. I, I can't remember how old I was when it happened. So, so no, no, that you, they were hanging out yeah, of the roller disco, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Back then, it it really and it's sad to say, but it really didn't have much of an impact because we were kind of immune to that. That uh -huh, was a shock uh -huh, for the uh -huh, world. Okay. It wasn't a shock for yeah, South Central. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it wasn't a shock for my community. That was the just, aha just moment yeah, yeah, for the world. So for me, it was like, okay, it was cool. They they, they were caught, fry their ass, you know, it was wrong. But it wasn't the first time we've seen it or I saw it. So, um, but I, I guess the good thing out of it was that was really the introduction of body cam or social media in, in law enforcement. And, you know, the world got to peek inside of, you know, or pull the curtain back. And now we have officers with body cameras and things like that. So, it, you know, it, it sucks that it was him, but in a sense, that was kind of a, I guess, a good thing for law enforcement because it showed like, hey, this, this is real. The community has been complaining about this shit and mm -hmm. we haven't been listening for a long time. And, you know, it's unfortunate he was the victim of it. And, you know, he had to, that had to happen to him for people to say, okay, maybe they are right. You know, maybe there is more to it and they're just not salty, angry black people complaining about, you know, these great men who go out into the neighborhood and do the Lord's work. Mm. It's like, no dog, you guys yeah, are yeah. abusing your real. power. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so are things generally better today than they were back then? Is there a path that looks like things are getting better or better for who? Uh, well, I mean, so we, ideally, where? we want a, a police force that is not abusing their power. We want a police force that's looking out for us and doing a great job. Right. Is it. I, again, that's, you know, that's questions for different communities. You ask people in Minneapolis and they'll say no. Yeah. <laughs> you ask people where, who is the white kid that shot, Three people with an AR, and now he's a national hero. Kenosha, Wisconsin, I forget. Yeah. They'll say no. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we talk about that video. And when I saw that, I I got emotional. It was the first time I had got emotional about a police event. And I still won't talk shit about the officers. But mm -hmm. here you have a kid or a person with an AR-15, and you have a crowd. You have a call of shots fired. You have a crowd walking behind him saying he just shot someone and he walks right up to a police car, talks to the officer inside the police car, walks past three Bearcats going to the shooting and just walks home. And I was like, that was the most depressing. That was the most disappointing day I've ever had as a police officer watching that video because they just let a murderer walk up to their car, have a conversation with him and walk home. What's, what's a Bearcat? The big armored police vehicle where they're okay. in bulletproof got the guy on the turret looking badass yeah and so the bearcats i believe there was two or three bearcats driving down the street mm -hmm. and he's walking and there's a crowd of people saying that's him that's him that's him that's him mm -hmm. he has this ar at a low ready so, and he walks right up to a police car has a conversation and walks home so so 
he, at the very least, in, in any reasonable officer's experience, some dude walking around with an AR should be addressed more than, hey, how you doing? Well, at the time, I, there were, he was probably one of many walking yeah, around with an AR. Yeah. yeah, and they probably all looked alike. So it wasn't unusual for him to be walking around with the AR. Yeah. The unusual part was people walking behind him saying, that's him. Yeah. <laughs> that's the guy that just shot these people. So you have and, reports of a crime. You should be addressing. And you have people identifying a criminal. Yeah. And he walks home. He walks to a police car, stands right next to a police car. This mm. is a threat. This guy yeah. just shot somebody, shot three people. He's a threat. He's a threat to society. Yeah. Uh, he's a threat to the community. He just killed three people and he walks home. Yeah. And that, to me, that was the worst day I've ever had. Because I, I see policing as a fraternity. Yeah. You put this uniform on, you're my brother. Mm -hmm. I will never talk shit about you. I will not comment on situations that I wasn't a part of. I don't know the circumstances. But that day right there was like my fraternity let me down. My brothers mm -hmm. let me down. That guy, not saying he should have been shot or killed or anything, but he should have been arrested right then and right there. Right. Yeah. And what the courts did is that's, as police officers, we should never worry about what the courts do, you know, because once we start being influenced by court decisions, then just like anything else, we want to be successful with. I'm not going to arrest this guy because the court won't prosecute, but I'll arrest this guy because they will prosecute. So the court should never influence what we do because right. now we're making decisions based on outcome, which yeah. I think is totally wrong. You, Hey, if you, if you do your job right, the law will protect you. And if the courts fail, then that's on the courts. Right. But that guy should have been arrested right there. And then the court fell later, which we all saw, but it should have had no impact on what happened that day. Mm. You have a question, Tony? No, I was saying the guy was underage, didn't have a, wasn't, uh, uh, um, he, he was under a minor. age, yeah, he was yeah. A minor, you know, I don't know. Is, but was, then was again, he was carry? one of many, so yeah. I, I'm not yeah. really critiquing yeah. all that, whether, yeah. you yeah. know, he should or shouldn't. He committed a crime. He was identified as a criminal and he walked home. But I'm saying for me, me being, you know, a black man, if I walked around with an oh, AR, shit. that wouldn't happen. If I would walk with an AR, you know, walk down the street, I'm getting stopped. They pull in everything. Well, they, they just probably going to bum rush me, throw me on the ground. Then they might ask, check for my ID and all that. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? quit, so quit hanging around disparity. Wisconsin, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, so that happened anywhere. Hanging out there with your wild black. Yeah, that you know? that happened anywhere. Uh, what memories of regret or, or memories that you're not proud of dur during your law enforcement career? Uh, I can't talk about the regrets because <laughs> people connect the dots <laughs> and say, yeah, you did do your job that day. But you know what? It's, race plays a huge part in it and I, I always tell people a story about sometimes as a police officer you want the pendulum to swing so you take it on yourself like you know what i've seen uh my shift bringing a lot of minorities so fuck it, i'm not going to bring in any minorities mm. i'm gonna just turn put my shades on uh we call it put the blinders on mm. and then i remember one night where I had that feeling I was working a young shift or a shift with young guys and they were bringing in a lot of minorities, not mm -hmm. just black, Hispanic, just minorities for kind of, you know, chicken shit. No, I, I shouldn't say chicken shit violations. They were crimes. Smaller offenses. I, I shouldn't say that. It was just, they were bringing in a lot of minorities and rightfully so, mm. you know, I'm not going to take anything from their arrest. They were good arrests, but I was feeling a certain way about it. Like, you know, I'm, I'm here, I wanna serve my community. I've seen all this police abuse. And I see a, I remember coming out of my police department, we call it the South Lot, coming out of South Lot. And I see a car four deep, kind of speeding west on Cover Boulevard. Mm. And it just didn't look right. I was like, fuck. But I could kind of see in it, it looked like four young black kids. And I was like, fuck it, I'm not stopping them right then about two three minutes later i hear one of my partners go traffic on the vehicle and i'm like shit all right do i want to go back them up but then another unit responds backs him up and so i continue on and he runs someone for once and warrants and the guy comes back with a felony warrant 
Mm-hmm. Then he runs the second individual, comes back with a felony warrant. Then the third individual, I think, comes back on probation. Mm-hmm. Then the fourth individual comes back on probation. And I, I think they end up finding like guns and dope in the car. And it was a badass arrest. It's a great arrest. Mm. But for the rest of that shift and probably a week or so after, I felt guilty because I didn't do my job as a police officer. I saw mm. it. I knew something wasn't right. Mm. I should have stopped it. But because I was on this color shit, mm. yeah. <laughs> being super yeah. pro black, I mm. let two felons armed with the gun and dope drive through the city. Thank God my partner stopped them. They wow. saw it and they reacted. So you have those internal conflicts sometimes as a black police officer. And I used to tell people like, you're never black enough. You're never blue enough. So as a black police officer, you're always fighting this. Like, man, you know, my community doesn't see me as one of them because I'm a police officer. Yeah. And my police family doesn't see me as one of them because I, I, I support my black brothers. So yeah. you're always in this internal conflict and you know that night i fucking failed as a police officer and i i'm, I'm always embarrassed to say it because you know i didn't do my job and i didn't do it because of this racial component what's well, interesting because it, it came from a good place in your heart mm-hmm. you know you wanted to help people and you're saying are we are we unnecessarily targeting or, or ending up having a negative impact on our on our minorities mm-hmm. so your, your heart was in a good place so it's it's it's, it's sad to see you struggle with that. Yeah, uh, I, I my heart should have been in policing, and I, I think that's the part where it got to me yeah. because my job was to be a police officer. It wasn't to be an advocate for black people. Mm. It wasn't, yeah. you know, <laughs> that night I was being an advocate for black people and I wasn't being a police officer. And, it, you know, I've, I let my community down. And, yeah. you know, they'll never know. And, you know, unless they, you know, Liam gets like, thousand <laughs> followers in core city <laughs> they'll never hear this story but internally when you go into this profession because you want to make a difference and you want to you know serve your community and you have this pride and you know and you don't do your job that day it's yeah it's a little I, I like you asked me what's one of my regrets and that's the first thing that come to mind because i wasn't a police officer that day i was mm. i was a politician or some shit i don't I, know well i think you're being human i, I honestly yeah yeah and i thank you for that story and a lot of the things you said earlier but um i've i've invited a couple police officers uh one that did say yes and then backed out at the end i think both of them in the end, I think both of them had a sense of they're afraid of what they're going to say on this podcast. Mm-hmm. And I totally understand. I understand that because if they're an active police officer, they have to be very careful what they say on this platform. Um, I think there's I, I I battle this balance of being human mm-hmm. and portraying an image because this will go on the internet and mm-hmm. this will affect what people think about police officers and mm-hmm. what they think about us and think about this platform. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I also value honesty and morality because in the, when I hear your story, mm-hmm. there's so much, you're, you're battling morality in your, in your mind. That's what it, to me, that's what I see. Mm-hmm. I feel I'm, I'm certain when I go my, to my a nine to five job and working in a cubicle, I see a lot of people that even in a workplace that's a nine to five working on a computer, there's, they throw their morality out out the door and yet they get away with these little petty, I'll call them crimes or crimes or whatever office crimes. Right. Indiscretions. And as a police officer, so it's the stakes are so much higher than the, the, the morality seems so much higher. So I wish this stuff was we could talk about this openly. I, I see it on both sides. I, I'm, I'm just, I don't know. I guess I'm just on a soapbox talking about, I wish <laughs> these things we could discuss openly, but I, I understand the other side. So say as a police officer, if that earlier uh, two police officers ago that I invited on the show and she said she couldn't do it, at, she said yes. And then she said, no. And then I thought about it. I was like, she probably, I'm guessing either she went to some friends and said, Hey, I should, I do this podcast. And then prior coworkers, other police officers like, Hey, you can't talk about mm-hmm. what you do because you're, you're an active cop right now and whatnot. And, or they have to worry about what she said. Cause then she could lose her job afterwards. But I think there's an the aspect of the human side of it. It's unfortunate that we can't like, if she had a personality like you, where she's talking about the morality and she's talking about things that she either regret and the things that she's proud of, 
But if we can't get her on, then we can't share these stories. So mm-hmm. I, I understand the double edged sword of all this. And then even in the office setting, like if uh, I get certain people that own companies and talk about certain profits or how much money that they make or they can't say it on air. Mm-hmm. And I've actually had recordings. I had I had to delete X amount of minutes from a recording mm-hmm. because it was company trade secrets. But then it was things that could have really helped the community to see that side of it. Mm-hmm. And to me, it's like, man, we live in the society where people are able to share some things, but then a lot of it's hidden. The things that are hidden are really important. Mm-hmm. So anyways, that's sorry, my soapbox. No, no, that, that's a great point because everything I'm sharing with you, I've shared. Yeah, mm-hmm. I've never done it in one three hours heading. <laughs> 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 but these stories, I don't mind. I didn't mind telling them as a police officer. It's my truth. Who are you to tell me I can't tell my truth? Um, so I've always talked about these things. Uh, like I said, when I recruit minorities, I tell them, hey, this is what it, it's not an inclusive profession. I mean, I don't know if you guys ever been in a police station, but for me, mm. and I'll, I'll share two quick stories. Uh, and I, I love Culver City. Culver City is the best freaking police department on the planet. I will preach that from the mountaintops. Um, but when I walked those halls in Culver City, and I, for the most part, every police station I've been in, they all have pictures of their history. They're proud of their history. Mm. And it's all these courageous white men who did this job before I did. Mm. But when I look at those pictures, it just tells me my history doesn't exist. Mm. I, I don't have no history in this profession. So every time I walk those halls and I see these pictures, I'm just reminded like, we either it, it it sends this message like we didn't exist on this planet or it, if you really know the history of the policing then we were the people on the other side and mm, they yeah. got credit yeah and you know so and that's for me that's i would say 90 percent of the departments i've been in that's all you see you walk through those halls and you know your your history is not ex- existential if you're if you're a minority it's the great white man of yesteryear Mm. and you know it's sad it's not an inclusive environment so now that you know you're trying to bring other minorities in and this culture isn't an inclusive culture because yeah we all want to aspire to get on that wall and we have to do the things they did and you know it's going to make the minority feel inferior Uh, so yeah it's you know it's it's one of those things like I never hit my truth. Uh, I never said one day or I, I never shied away from saying one day I want my picture on that wall. So it could start with me. Uh, this is the part. It is, <laughs> this is my disclaimer. I'm about to hate on Tom Brady. <laughs> but <laughs> white motherfucker. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> when I started policing 14 years ago, I kid you not. I read that speech, Men in the Arena by Teddy Roosevelt. And I always knew I wanted to be a police officer. But when I read that speech, I had never articulated it like that. I knew I wasn't going to be the critic in the stands. I wanted to be the man in the arena with your face all marred with dust and blood and sweat. So for me, it was like, hey, if I'm going to change this, I'm going to get down here and I'm going to do the work. I'm not going to rely on someone to go be the change that I want to see in this world. No, I'm going to go do that. So for 14 years, I kind of built my thing on that Teddy Roosevelt speech. And I say, I hate Tom Brady because he do one little podcast and mention it. And now it's an <laughs> eight part <laughs> mini series or so. But I'm like, man, I've been preaching that for 14 <laughs> years now. So, but yeah, it, it, you know, the, and for me, that's what it was. It was like, I saw the abuse. I saw the mistreatment and I was, it was for me, it was like, you know, I'm not going to just talk about it. I'm going to become a police officer and I'm going to treat people with respect and show other police officers, you can do this job. You can be a professional. You could treat people re- with respect and, and talk to the community and still have the respect of your peers, which I, I know I did. You, I always say you pull my ghetto credit and it's just as good as anyone's credit. <laughs> so I had the respect of my peers. I had the respect of my community, you know, my jacket is full of accommodations and awards and certifications and all the other Asians you could get. But I did it, in my opinion, I did it the right way. And I think if you ask anyone, they'll, they'll tell you the same. 
So I wish I wish everybody in America could hear Terry's stories. Well, uh, that's why we have the podcast. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's it's been a wonderful window into into the policing world yeah. for us. Is this what you want to talk about, or do you want to get deeper, or do you want to talk about something else, or what? Uh, I what mean, did you have in I've mind? I've still got a few questions. Yeah, so. I got some uh, more, yeah, too. Let's, okay, let's the boys go. want to get right, deeper. Hey, I, I'm here, so how, we, right. we could talk about whatever. How do you think um, distance has impacted your thoughts on policing? Because you're looking at about two years away, removed, where you can, you're two years out, or would you? What? I retired October 2021, so I'm a couple months out. Oh, oh wow. okay, yeah. okay, okay. Yeah. And, and to be honest, I'm still decompressing. And okay. It, it, it's a shift. Like I said, for much of my career, everyone's friend or foe. That's that's just how it is, dude. It, your friend or your foe. So just trying to kind of reintegrate in a world and not have that mentality where I'm looking at everyone as a suspect or, you know, you're either in this category or that category. It's hard. And it's, it's hard, especially when you're with your kids and you're always on guard and, mm. you know, you're tense and you're tight and you're uncomfortable and, you know, I don't want to be here because it's too many people and I don't know. It, it, it's, you know, I, <laughs> when I was on IOD, I had knee surgery and I was out of work for a couple months. And what's, what's IOD? Injury on duty. Okay. So gotcha. you're off duty, but it's as a result of an injury on duty. Right. So I took that time and I got to pick up my kids and go to their soccer games and do all the fun dad things. Yeah. And I remember talking to other parents and, you know, they would talk about how bad their day was because the barista fucked up their coffee in the morning <laughs> or someone cut them off on the freeway. That's or ridiculous. And I was like, you know what? I deserve that life. That's the life. I, if the worst part of my day is someone didn't get my coffee right, that's a damn good day, right? So, and I was like, I deserve that life. So now that I'm- Coconut milk. Right? <laughs> so now that I'm there, it's like, it's almost uncomfortable. Like, I don't, it's, Yeah, it's like, I have to learn how to live without chaos. You're, you're out of the war zone. Yeah. It, adjusting back to civilian life. Right. Yeah. It, it's crazy because, you know, we're traumatized. When I moved, funny story, when I moved to Pittsburgh, and I moved there, it was, school wasn't in session. Uh, it was in the summer and I'm staying in a dorm and I'm calling home and I tell my mom, I can't, and the dorm was up on the hill, it was called Sutherland. And I'm telling my mom, I can't sleep in this room and we don't know why. And I'm like, mm. fuck, I'm just having a hard time sleeping. Too quiet. So school starts back up <laughs> and they were like, hey, this dorm is full. We're going to move you to the towers. The towers is right next to a level one trauma center. Uh, so all night it's helicopters, it's sirens, it's buses, just, and I slept like a baby. Uh, it was like being home. Wow. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> yeah, like was, yeah. <laughs> so, and that's, and now that's it all over again. My life is so peaceful. It's like, I don't, man, I, it's almost, I read an article in GQ last night about, uh, DeMar DeRozan. And he talked about self-sabotaging because he's, he was, he wasn't used to the tranquility mm, of life. Yeah. And that's how I feel like, dude, I'm, it's almost stressful to be, you yeah. know, in Vegas and in a quiet community and just sit on a couch and kind of enjoy retirement. Like something ain't right. Something about to happen. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I have those You're internal used to be battles. on high alert. I have those day, yeah. internal battles and, you know, it's, you know, I, I retired. It was a stress related claim. I saw it was PTSD and, you know, I had to see a shrink and yeah, and we talk a lot and because I have those internal struggles, like something ain't right. It's too yeah. damn quiet. <laughs> yeah. I'm used to, I, since day one, since I was born, I was born in the chaos. So if yeah. you want, if you want to write a book on how to improve policing, I will help you with that book in any way. Absolutely. You want. <laughs> absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. So right. shockingly, any yeah. way I could support, let me know. Yeah. Yeah. Start absolutely. writing for me. <laughs> 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 I have the thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I, I do journal some of the stuff, but yeah, I'm just not at that point. And it's funny. I talk to my wife because yeah, I'm like, I got to get out the house. And if I'm ever going to finish this book, I got to get out the house. I need an office or a room or whatever. But yeah. at some point, I, I'm I'm going to get to that point and just start putting pen to paper and making it happen. Yeah, awesome. Uh, I got a story. Just want your opinion on it. Um, I have a black friend. She, uh, I'll leave her name out of the story, but that's good. She's just one old. black friend. <laughs> good, just good, one. Yeah. Just one for this story. Yeah. She's uh, an important part in this story. She got pulled over for a speeding ticket. I, I believe like on a freeway or whatever. Uh, she got pulled over speeding 
And then a cop, the cop comes up, checks her name and says, Hey, you know, there's a warrant out for your arrest. She's, um, no. And so to describe this girl, she's super bubbly, super positive all the time. She is probably one of the most positive people I know. So I can't imagine her hurting anyone or even intentionally breaking any laws. But the cop says, yeah, there's a uh, warrant out for your arrest. And she's, and he, um, I forget. Oh, there was a detail of the, the, the first and last name match that or so for she somehow was it after shoot I'm, I'm messing up the story i think it was after oh yeah uh, sorry she was misidentified yeah right. that's where it's getting to so she the cop uh says well i gotta arrest you this warrant out for your arrest so he starts arresting her she starts crying already mm-hmm. and then he takes her into the police office, uh, the police station. And then I think the mom and the uncle came and then they're like, yeah, this is not her. You have, this is a misidentity. This is the wrong mm-hmm. person. And he's like, I'm sorry. The, the, the name matches. Um, mm-hmm. I got to I got to continue on with this. <clears throat> and then they get done with the paperwork. And then there's a point where I believe he, he was escorting her and she start at, at this point, the paperwork's like done. So she's feeling it on her. Mm-hmm. She starts bawling hysterically. She's like, it wasn't me. I didn't do anything. I, I can't go. I don't want to go. She, mm-hmm. in her mind, being a black woman, being ra- raised on the thoughts of if you get in trouble with the cops or go to jail, you're going to get fucked up. Mm-hmm. Either you're going to get beat up or either you're going to get beat up by the, by the cop or you're going to get beat up in the prison by other inmates or by the prison guard. Mm-hmm. So she was hysterically crying and the cop stops and he's like, you really aren't her. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. I still have to take you. Mm-hmm. I believe you. I, I see it on your face. I see it in your, your shaking of the hands, everything. You aren't her, but I'm sorry. I have to do this. Mm-hmm. Um, she goes in and then she gets the strip search and we're like, she's got to spread her, her cheeks and everything for the, the cop lady, the prison guard lady to make mm-hmm. sure she doesn't have weapons or whatnot. She says that was the lowest point of her life at that very moment. She told herself she's going to do everything in her power to never be here ever again. Mm-hmm. Granted that in that point, there's not much she could do. She had to wait another day before, um, it, before it was all ironed out and she was able to get out. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways, just that, that's the story. And I just, I don't, I don't know kind of what to feel like is, I don't think, I think the cops just doing what he's has to do. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately. Um, I don't know. What's your thoughts on any piece of that? <laughs> this might come as a surprise. And I don't know if you guys heard this before, but People lie to us all the time. Oh, so yeah. someone yeah, said, yeah, hey, yeah. that's not what? me. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, okay, you're. it's not you. Uh, but can't they run social? Like it, your, it, your social security? Or how do they again, make that I, distinction? I, I won't talk what, about. But what is the process for you guys when, when that, I'm sure that situation has arisen before? Like, can't they look at someone's social security and say, hey, this or. So I, I can't speak to the officer. Because, again, every department is different. I don't know what his resources were. Mm-hmm. You know, for mm-hmm. us, yeah, we're going to check every w- resource we have to make sure it ain't her. If she's at that point and we can see it. And But if we can't prove that it's not true, yeah. she's a wanted felon. I'm, a, mm-hmm. I'm not going to let some girl go because she's crying. I mean, like I said, people lie to us all the time. The officer did his job. If he couldn't prove her true identity... Mm-hmm. And, he did what he had to do and let it go to someone else who can. And it's, it's unfortunate, but that's the job. And, you know, it's not always good. And, you know, in situations like that, she's misidentified for whatever reason. Uh, it could have been a clerical error. It could have been something like, and keep in mind, sometimes you're wanted for a crime that maybe you had a small participation in. And, you know, I, I don't know. Maybe it was her vehicle. Maybe her son used her vehicle. Like, you get that all the time. Hey, this person is wanted by the police because this vehicle was used in a crime and we're going to talk to you. Yeah, maybe you weren't driving it, but it's your car. So you're going to tell us who was driving it. So, you know, I, I don't know the circus circumstances of that. I don't know what his resources were, but 
to me, as unfortunate as it sounds, it sounds like the officer did his job. Yeah. So, so, yeah. so then would you support giving your kids weird ass unique names so they don't get mistakenly <laughs> identified as felons? No, because then they'll just get in fights at school for having <laughs> weird ass unique names. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So what, now you have a delinquent. On your- <laughs> what would you do in an instance like that? Let's say you were pulled over and they say we have a Terry Murphy, got a warrant out for his arrest. How would you address or how would you handle that situation? It's probably the same way she did. I mean, there's nothing you could do. Hey, it's not, it's me. not me, man. Yeah, it's not, it's not me. Um, you know, do whatever you have to do. I'm being a police officer. I'm more like, okay, I, I know you do what you have to do. I'll write it out. And at some point, the truth to come up, hopefully it's sooner than later before I spend two months. In uh, county. Uh, county. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, Hey, do what you have to do. Let's make some home calls. And, uh, I, you know, I, 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 Definitely wouldn't resist because now you're, you're, this situation is escalating too quick. It's just, hey, and keep them, I, you know, I don't want to be handcuffed. I, I don't want any of that. But, you know, this person has, has been granted authority by the county, the state, whatever it is to do this job. For some reason, the judge has issued a warrant for your arrest. You, the, the officer doesn't have a choice to not. No, if it's a felony warrant, you're, you're going. It's, there's yeah. there's no unless you tell me you have some easily transmissible disease that could you know infect the entire jail population and <laughs> the, the you're oh going COVID to will keep you out of jail <laughs> it, it, it did for a while yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah when it first happened it was hey I got COVID okay here's your citation up here in court wow yeah mm. officer uh, I got all the Delta and Omicrons yeah now I I don't <laughs> know. I, I mean, I, I I haven't worked in a while, <laughs> thank God. But now I, I don't know. I mean, they might just yeah. get take you to the hospital and keep you in a secure facility. And I I don't know because COVID's here. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but yeah, when it first hit, wow. Okay. Were, Interesting. So you uh, used your gun once. Mm-hmm. Can you tell us about that story. Uh yeah. So you know, like I said, I. I, I, I'm going to walk on eggshells because I respect the person who was, it was a fatal shooting. Uh, uh, it was someone's kid, someone's sister, or someone's brother. Uh, I don't know if the, the individual was married or not, but it was <laughs> crazy enough. It was my first day as sergeant. <laughs> okay. So I was an acting sergeant for about six months. Uh, my chief of police called me, told me, uh, I was going to be, and this was like a Thursday. He called me, said, Hey, Terry, we're done with the testing. You're going to be our sergeant. So Saturday, August 18th, never forget the day, 2018. My father's birthday. Really? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, first day as an official sergeant, uh, I'm doing my thing. It's 12 o'clock on a Saturday. Culver city is kind of buzzing. It's not busy, but you know, people are milling around. Of course he has now have some drinks. 12 yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, 12 p.m. Well, yeah, even oh, still. Noon? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and Culver City has great restaurants. So people yeah. go there and they just park and go and it's it's a great community to to be in and walk through. And you know, I think the first and I'll I'll just paint the entire picture. The the first call, it was a slow morning. I uh, I think I had four cars working that day. Um, there was a call that came out, male subject seen punching a female subject in the face at the mall. Hmm. And I have two L cars, one A car that's on lunch, L car or single man cars, A car is a two man car, they're at lunch. And then, sorry, I had three L cars and one A car. So I, two L cars, they're responding to the mall. And I, think I, yeah, my eight cars at lunch and then about 30 seconds out. Cause I, I'm thinking, okay, two L cars are going, if this guy's punching his female in the face, he's going to run when the police get there. So yeah, let's make sure we send another unit. <laughs> Dude, that punch women in the face. Are yeah. He's, he's going to run. It's going to be a, foot, <laughs> it's going to be a foot pursuit through the mall. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, a runner. Yeah, exactly. So, and then about 30 seconds after that, uh, we get a call, possible domestic violence occurring or domestic dispute occurring at some, I, I, I didn't even hear the address because, mm. <laughs> okay, wait, let me back up. Before the call came out, 
the watch commander, which is the sergeant inside or the, the lieutenant who's responsible for the city. Hmm. Uh, he's like the senior guy on the shift that day. He calls me into the office and says, Terry, our chief of police is flying in. Our assistant chief of police is flying in the LAX around three o'clock. We need someone to go pick him up. Okay. I'm like, okay, that's cool. You know, it's a slow day. Five no elbows? A, yeah. I, we're, we're cool. We know each other. Yeah. Everyone's on a first name basis. Culver City is only 100 police officers. So, okay. you know, we shoot the shit with the chief all the time. It's, it's not a big deal. The A chief, too. I call him the A chief. Um, so it's like, all right, cool. Three o'clock. It's noon. If I'm available, I'll go get them. If we have a unit available, mm -hmm. I'll send someone. Um, so when that second call came out of a possible domestic couple, her arguing, that's not necessarily emergency call. Couples argue all the time, uh, but I only have one L car left. And he's responding to that call. And domestic disputes are the most volatile calls because they call you for help, but they don't want to see you hurt their loved one. So I'm at the station. I hear the L car say he's going to go. And I'm like, okay, I'll back him up. Uh, finish my conversation with the watch commander. I get in my car. As dispatch, hey, can you repeat the address of that call? Because I really wasn't paying attention. Yeah. And she says, stand by. We're getting multiple calls. And I'm like, oh, shit, okay. Hmm. This might be good. And maybe like a couple seconds after that, it, she tones it out. It's now emergency. Call. Boop, boop, boop. Hmm. Uh, subject scene running through the alley with blood. And I'm like, so I'm cold Ooh. three at this point. She gives me the address. I get to the call in 30 seconds. That's customer service. right? <laughs> <laughs> That's customer service. That's what you want from a police department. Got driving right? skills. Yeah. <laughs> Future mayor so, of Culver City. <laughs> so 30 seconds. I'm in Las Vegas now. I ain't going back. <laughs> so I'm there in 30 seconds. And she says suspect was running westbound through the alley approaching Mentone. I'm a former football player i spin my car around park i run west to the alley and the person's not there but i never got a suspect description hmm. so i'm at the mouth yeah, they of the blood on them yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh actually all i heard was barefoot for oh, some okay. reason i that's the only thing i heard uh -huh. so i'm at the west mouth of the alley the units arriving my a car broke their lunch and the l car they cover the east part of the alley so now I tell them, hey, clear the alley towards me. He's got to be in here. No way this guy is faster than me. I, I, I know I got here before he got here. So they're clearing the alley towards me. And I see probably like 75 yards south of me. I just, it was just one guy on the street. I could see him, but okay, whatever. He's way down by the other intersection. And as they're clearing the alley towards me, I hear one of the officers start yelling. So I turn and look. And I realize whoever he's yelling at, I can't see the person. Mm -hmm. Whoever it is, it's not a threat. Just by his body language, whatever he was communicating, mm -hmm. it's not a threat. So I turn back and that subject I saw 75 yards is now about 40 yards. And I'm like, okay, this person's moving pretty good. Maybe it's a resident telling me bad guys down here, but I'm going to hold my spot mm -hmm. just so I could make sure I have their back. Uh, and then as I'm waiting for them to continue to clear, I get another call. The victim is inside this residence. I think it was. Uh, I look and from where I, I'm standing, I can see the house. It's like three houses south of. And I'm like, OK, I'll start walking. I'll go meet with the victim because I think they said she was bleeding or something like that. Let's get her medical attention. I start walking south. The guy I saw, he's running north, so this distance is closing considerably quick. Um, as I'm walking, he steps off the curb line, and he just beelines straight towards me, full out sprint. Wow. And we're probably, we're not even at, at yards anymore. We're talking feet, 10 to 15 feet apart. And I saw he had a meat cleaver. Holy and, cow. And when I say the meat cleaver, he had it the thin way down by his thigh. So it's probably as thick as this cord, but it's just that little silver glint that, you know, I recognize as a knife or a weapon. Yeah. So this got real dangerous real fast. Yeah. I mean, I had milliseconds to 
make a decision. Right? Yeah. You know, you, and that, that's the type of situation you're in. Like, is that what I think it is? And so anyway, long story short, I, <laughs> and it's crazy because in policing, we talk about time distortion, auditory distortion, and yeah. you know how you, you just focus in tunnel vision. So I probably have less than maybe a second to determine if that's the threat because it's down by his thigh yeah, and it's like, okay, knife. And I remember thinking and no hyperbole, no exaggeration, front sight, got to do it. Like I'm praying to God. Like, he's hey, coming at you fast. Yeah. I'm like, Hey, down on you. Yeah. Like, forgive me for what I'm about to do. I don't even have time to say it. I, I just, and again, this is my actual thought. Yeah. Front sight, got to do it. And I fired what I thought was two shots. Uh, I think it ended up being three, but I heard the first one. And after that, I didn't hear anything else. And I felt the recoil of the second one, which actually was the third one. But I, I thought it was the second one. And I look over my front side and I see this black dot appear on his chest. Again, no hyperbole. And I remember looking like almost quizzically like that dog. You tilt your head and was like, what's that? And then about, it felt like a whole second, I saw blood trickle out. And I was yeah. like, oh, he got shot. And then I hear the machete or the meat cleaver skipping on the ground by me. Ding, yeah. ding, 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 ding. And he falls and uh, someone said, I didn't even realize I had three other officers on side of me. It's, right. You're just locked in at that point. You, you know, you're not looking around to see who, yeah. you know, you're, you're in battle time. Yeah, you're in life saving mode. So. I have three other officers on side of me and I hear someone say cuff him. And at that moment, it was like this entire sequence was in freeze frame. Right. Like it was just going frame by frame by frame. Like I, I, I don't want to exaggerate, but I actually saw or what I think was the bullet burrowing into his chest. Yeah. Like it was moving that slow. So when uh, the officer said cuff him, it was like someone hit play and yeah. I could hear all these sounds and now I could smell gunpowder and my ears are kind of ringing. And it was, um, the other officers, I'm kind of at the low ready. They handcuff them, call paramedics and me being me is I still got to go rescue the damsel in distress. And, <laughs> yeah. So I'm going towards the house and I remember the husband comes out and at this point, I don't know what's what, you know, so yeah. I'm, gun on him hey come over here pat him down he comes out who else is in the house my wife and the girls uh, mm. make our actually i told you one of y'all go get a long gun at this point <laughs> we're covering windows we don't know what the hell's going on if this is crime scene or not so a long so, gun is a rifle a rifle go get the yeah. ar but i go get the long gun uh we go and make our approach to the house and make our announcement cover city police department anyone inside yada 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 yeah. And we could hear like or I can hear, I can't I'm not gonna say we like muffles in the background. Okay. Do it again. Cover Cover City Police Department, anyone inside, make yourself known, yada. And again, muffles, and I'm thinking, oh shit, I gotta go into this house. Last thing I wanna do is go into a house. So, so muffle, you can hear some people. I can in hear there. some ruffling, whatever. We're back she might have said we're back here, I but I really couldn't make it out. But the last thing I want to do is walk into a house after I'd just been in a right. fatal shoot or a shooting yeah. at the time. The, I didn't know the person had passed away. Uh, so now that we're making entry, I'm pieing this door. And the way it's set up, this front door, but then there's like this wall that kind of extends halfway into the house. So I pie this door and I'm like, shit, I can't even see in the house. I could see that this wall opens up into a living room. So now I entered the threshold and now I got to pie the other way just to look into this house. And, and, and you go, you're going in cause your report is that there's somebody that needs she's help. She's bleeding inside. Yeah. Uh, so I pie the other way and this house, it just opens up. It's this huge open floor plan. Mm -hmm. You can see from this wall all the way into the backyard to the, the, the wall huge glass patio windows and it's just beautiful mm. and in in the middle of this huge open floor plan is a girl covered in blood standing there with a towel on her face mm. and she says to me first thing she says mm -hmm. did you just shoot my brother and i'm like mm. fuck how do you answer that yeah like and it was you know hey come sit down take a seat 
Right. We're going to get you medical attention, but I got to clear this house now. So I, yeah, you know, we call for medical attention, get her and I clear the house. And by the time I'm done clearing the house, mm-hmm. both of them are, they're gone to the hospital. That's how big this house was. Like, wow. you know, when you're clear a house, you're systematic room by room, mm-hmm. by room, yeah. by room. Yeah. This is, you can't just this say, is close quarters. Yeah, combat. You, you can't just say clear. <laughs> yeah. So by the time I clear it, but it sounds like you're also undermanned, right? Are you solo in the house here? Uh, or is, at the time guys? I had a partner, but then he stays with the victim. So I'm kind of clearing it at this point. Cause you know, we have a crime scene here. Yeah. We have a victim here. And I didn't even know that the crime had originated at the other place. So we had like three or four crime scenes going on. Right. So the officers are spread out. And like I said, I only had six officers working that day. Yeah. Oh, uh, so, uh, they end up transporting her guy ends up passing away and uh after that you know when we talk about training and all that stuff Mm -hmm. when you look someone in the eye and take their life and there's a lot of trauma with that yeah so i had to deal with the not only the residuals of that when i mentioned earlier i had like uh, a gang member threaten my life Mm -hmm. um department bought security cameras that happened maybe three or four months after that shooting Mm. Then three or four months after that incident, I had knee surgery. So within like five or six months, I had all these traumatic life events that occurred. Right. And at some point in between or during, I just stopped sleeping, dude. It was it was crazy. Mm. I would go, I was sleeping probably two hours a night. Yeah. Damn. And you know, you're dealing with a stressful job. I can't sleep. I'm hyper vigilant. I used to tell people if a rat farted in my house, I heard it. It was yeah. like every creek. I'm up like what the fuck is is that the dude yeah um i wasn't so much having flashbacks of the shooting it was just all this trauma that i i just right. couldn't deal with and with that came a lot of drinking so now i'm drinking a lot and i'm sleeping a little and it just got to the point where i was it was affecting my my overall being my wellness my relationship with my wife i we were probably one argument away from divorce or separating yeah. at the time we weren't married. And I had to really like do some self-reflection and say, what's important to me. Yeah. You know, cause I'm about to lose my family and I know it. Uh, yeah. And I realized I was, I was circling a drain and I knew it. And the, my saving grace was I saw the signs of depression. I saw yeah. the signs of alcohol abuse. And a lot of people don't know, but policing has the highest domestic violence rate, the highest obesity rate, the highest sudden cardiac arrest, the highest, <laughs> what else? What, suicide, what didn't I? Yeah. Suicide right. rate. Yeah. So I, this is a fucked up job that messes right, your head you up. You deal right? with a lot of stress and you yeah. compartmentalize it. And, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, at some point your stress cup just gets full yeah. and it overflows and you know, like I said, when most people, if their bad day is a bad cup of coffee, then shit, yeah. I, my stress cup was, you know, I grew up in this. So I didn't yeah. even realize all the trauma I carried along. And you talk yeah. to a shrink and they yeah. gonna bring that shit out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank so, you for sharing yeah. that, that terrible part of your life with us. Mm-hmm. Um, with, once you realize, hey man, this shit is going, I'm, I'm circling the drain. I'm going to get flushed. Mm-hmm. This isn't going well. How do you? How do you, what, what steps do you take to pull yourself out? What, how do you change? So for me, trend? so for me, it was one of those epiphanies. I, it's funny. I still remember today. I went and got, I was off work or I was going to schedule to work later that day. I wasn't sleeping. I'm laying in bed. I walk downstairs and I get a slice of pizza just out of the refrigerator, put it in a microwave, take it out. And I go back upstairs and I lay down on bed. And I didn't grab a plate, a napkin, or anything like that. I just put the pizza on my chest, and I was laying in bed eating a pizza, and I was like, this is the laziest shit I ever done. <laughs> like, oh, my God. And This is not Terry. And I, I, I wasn't feeling it, and I end up calling off work, and this was the first time in my career I called off work when I wasn't sick or something like that. It was just she mentally did. I was done. I was yeah. burnt. And when I did that, I – called a psychiatrist who our department had worked with and i was like i need help yeah this is what's going on i need help and i started talking to her and 
I was referred to different psychiatrists and, you know, and it was rough. I went back to work a couple of times and the drinking kept repeating itself. And it was, mm. like I said, and at that point, I'm a very hands-on dad. And, mm. you know, when you're in that depression mode, you don't want to do anything. So I'm yeah. just sitting on the couch, probably kids playing are a place, lot of work, probably playing PlayStation, watching TV. And my kids are like, dad, let's go outside. And I'm like, no. So they're seeing me as this lazy figure who doesn't want to do anything. But mentally, I just don't have the energy. You're broken. And you're so, mostly bankrupt. Yeah, I, I, I had to start talking to a shrink. And, you know, luckily for me, I did that. And it probably saved my relationship, my marriage. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm not a stereotype <laughs> black man with two kids <laughs> or kids spread out across the country. <laughs> you know, I'm very involved and. In, yeah, it was a rough goal. It was probably the most difficult part of my life. Uh, yeah, it, and I, I think that's one of the things that we forget when, or we, we don't appreciate with our police officers. Like, they yeah. go through some shit. And, I, and, and the culture is you, you, you suck it up, you man up. So, yeah. but I was, I, me, myself, I, was, I couldn't do it because I knew I was going to lose my family. Mm. And that's way more important than any job because that's all it is. The policing will never define me. Um, it was just something I felt like I was called to do, yeah. but you can have more than one calling. So now I feel like I'm on my hero's journey. I have made it through the shittiest of situations <laughs> and it's time to give back to the kids. And I, you know, I teach the youth now and, you know, I coach football and I enjoy every day of it. And it's almost like a reward. Like, hey, yeah, you know, you did the unfortunate, you know, God put you in this situation to, I mean, we don't know how many lives I've saved that day. The guy, yeah. basically he s sliced his sister's face off mm. and he's running through the streets of Culver City. So we don't know what the outcome would have been, but it was like, hey, you did what I asked of you and here's your reward. Let's go. And I don't mean like reward for taking a life, but you dealt you, with the worst. You, you've made enough sacrifices. Yeah. And so so now I just enjoy waking up every day, seeing my kids and, hey, let's go play football. Let's go do this. Let's go train. I yeah. coach Tony's kid and it's, you know, and that's kind of, I just applied to be a substitute teacher and I want to coach high school Is he football. a decent football coach? Man, I'm the best. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I can <laughs> answer that. <laughs> You, nah, seem, you seem like a great dude. Yeah, uh, you and, seem like a fantastic role yeah, model for yeah, everybody out yeah, there. Yeah. And that's yeah. what coaching is. You know, for me, it's not just X's and O's. It's building relationships because Tony mm. kids might not learn the same as my kids. So I have to find a way to communicate and connect with him. And, you know, and th that's what I enjoy doing. I love communicating and connecting to people and listening to their story. And yeah. And yeah. And, and all that happens through football. And I am, I'm grateful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm grateful to be here. The uh, correctional officer that I interviewed, he said, to be a correctional officer, if you have, if you don't cause enough divorce, if your kids stop talking, wait, if you, to be a correctional officer, you almost have to be in a divorce, your kids don't talk to you, and you have some type of alcoholic addiction, because the job will either, it's going to break some bones and break, break your mind too, mm -hmm. that will cause the other th three things, the divorce, kids, um, and, and addiction. Uh, he says that job has it in, in it. So it sounds as a police officer, there's very much a connection. I think it feels like. So when I was going through the Academy, uh, his name was deputy Miley. And I, I think he was part of LA SD. The sheriff's department had a show mm. on TV. He was one of those deputies that was on TV. So I hope he doesn't mind me sharing his story. And <laughs> He's already his name. out there. <laughs> yeah. So, we're in the academy and he asked the class like hey how many people are married and you know group raised their hand and he told him he was like within i think he said like three or four years you're going to be divorced mm. and that group mostly the females were like that's kind of you know they were like i guess infuriated or mad at him like that's fucked up how can you say that I why, love, why you give me bad bye right man. i love my husband yeah and he was actually right. Most of our class, they end up being divorced yeah. because this job, it changes you, yeah. you know, and if I'm married to you or if I married you before you started this job, you're a completely different person. I didn't marry this deputy who, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, the 
person I married probably used to, and that's one thing police officers we don't do, and rightfully so, we don't talk about our job when we come home. I don't want to talk about all the bad things I saw at work, mm -hmm. but what type of relationship will survive without communication? Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, you, you know, that that's it. So... How Why can don't I, you care about this barista that fucked up my coconut? Right, pie? right, <laughs> right. So how can I be with you if I don't want to talk to you or I, I'm just done, emotionally drained, and we can't talk about my day or your day, and, you know, we're supposed to stay together. And so it's it's that double-edged sword, like, yeah, you know, you're not the person I married anymore. You're someone completely different. And There's a transformation when you become an officer. Absolutely. You're jaded, and I think every – police officer who lives in reality will tell you that you're jaded it, it, you, like i said you go in a party you're not looking to have a good time you're looking to see the ass who's armed who's the asshole and if you have a good time great <laughs> 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 but yeah it's yeah it, it's crazy i think uh, this is gonna sound weird i'm gonna connect the stories I, I knew this girl that was a skydiver and she seemed to only date other skydivers and to me it was just i, I was like m m you don't you want to find friends that, or a boyfriend that kind of also well rounds you? Like if you're skydiving, whatever the spectrum of a chart, if you live here in this world, mm -hmm. don't you also want somebody on this side of the world so you could share things? But she seemed to skydive and she only wanted to date somebody there. Mm -hmm. And then as then I was when I talked to the correctional officer, I was when he's talking about, yeah, he's been through a divorce. He's he's working things out with his kids um, and. I think of it as, okay, he lives here in that correctional officer world, but then maybe his wife is living over here and there's no way to, com it seems it's two big separate worlds, especially as a correctional officer, I'm guess, or even a police officer, you're dealing with things that are so different than a normal life. Mm -hmm. And maybe his wife over here is talking about the coconut lattes, mm -hmm. but there's no way to converge that difference, that gap in that divorce happens. Um, I so I, I I don't really have a point to that story except for I think I feel the the I sympathize with the difference. I've never I've never been in the shoes. I've I've been in I think or I've been in like one or two fights in my life as a kid. Mm -hmm. So that's the most extreme mm -hmm. that I've ever been. When I try to think about a police officer or a correctional officer dealing with violence as um, violence as a way of life and as not not. That just, it has just to daily be daily occurrence. Yes, yeah. Occurrence. yeah. Mm -hmm. I can. I don't understand that, but I sympathize. I see that there's this this spectrum where you live there, and I and I, I want to say I understand. No, I I can't say I understand the pain, but there's I empathy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That I that I empathize that there's some massive pain that you've been through. Um, I, that I'm I'm just saying thank you for your time as a correction uh, as a police officer thank you for your stories um thank you for being a good dude yeah yeah that's <laughs> we need, what we need <laughs> we need more good people around right yeah. and i hope we get more and i i hope to get m more of these stories from everyone i hope this podcast platform people see that this is i don't i don't think i'm trying to sit here and uncover the nastiness of america or the nastiness of people i think oh, i was gonna go there next <laughs> right. i think these stories show human sides of it right. like even though you've had to use your gun, even though it was a fatal incident, but we, I, I think through three hours, if someone sits through the first two hours and they hear your story, like, man, this guy is a good human. This guy is a good person. Right. And then to hear the, the hardships that you, that you've gone through, I, I think that's what we as a society needs more of these type of conversations. That's, these are some of the things that I'm, I'm trying to go towards in this podcast. No, I 100% agree with you. And that's why when I was asked to do it, I'm like, yeah, I'll do it. Because I, I think, I absolutely believe we got to have these open, honest communications. Uh, you know, I say sometimes I, I'm disgusted with the profession because they don't recognize their history. They act like those abuses didn't happen. Oh, say it did. Talk about it. Say, hey, I'm sorry. Apologize to the community. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's not like it's some secret. <laughs> everyone mm. knows what everyone knows. So yeah. just say, hey, yes, these, you know, atrocities happen or these abuses happen. Let's move forward. But if you never recognize it, if you never ask for forgiveness, if you never get out your car and get in the community and say, I'm not that person you think I am, then that perception is going to remain. Um, 
and again, these are things I was saying when I was a police officer. So coming out here and talking about it, I feel it's the only way to go. Um, I don't feel like, you know, I'm really sharing any trade secrets or talking bad about anyone. It's just, this is my truth. This is my reality. Uh, these are the circumstances I was placed in and <laughs> this is the outcome, you know, it's, it's all out there. So, but I, I totally agree. We need to have these conversations and, you know, there's this perception that it's always about protect the shield and all that. And for the most, and again, I, I can only talk from a very small department. I can't, I'm not a spokesperson for all law enforcement. I worked in Culver City. You know, I don't know how LAPD works. I don't know how LASD works. I don't know how some small town in Mississippi works. I, I don't know. But in Culver City, we're very progressive and our department is making those strides. And I think if every department got on board and said, hey, let's raise our hiring standard, which really is what it all boils down to, the training, the education, and you can quantify it with maybe a reduce of use of forces. You don't have this conversation about defund the police because people see like, okay, you're here to help us. But when you, you're getting all this funding and there's nothing positive coming out of it in the community, hey, we're still getting abused. We're still getting sentenced to 10 years for marijuana or some small you know amount of drugs and Here's some rich white kid who raped a chick getting six months of probation. There's that inequality. So, you know, I, yeah, I think we should talk about it. Uh, <laughs> I always say when those things happen, those inequalities, and they say some judge did this, I always want them to put the name out there. <laughs> Don't just say some judge. Yeah. Give me the name. <laughs> put that person out there. If a politician says something, don't give me the name. I want to know. Yeah. So that's, you know, if there's inequalities occurring, Stop shielding them. Talk about it. You know, yeah. there's nothing to hide if you're doing the right thing. Yes, I you know, agree with that. If everyone's not going to always be in agreement, but if you're doing the right thing, what what is there to hide? Mm -hmm. So, I, I I think it's difficult because as a police officer, you're on the sharp end of the sword, but behind that comes our unequal legal legal system, and then our our faulty flawed prison system. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there's a whole chain of events that starts at the arrest. Mm -hmm. uh, but as police officers, you can only enforce the laws that you're required to enforce. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, it, it would be impossible for an officer to change the inequality down the line, right? Is there, is, uh, it, is there more to it to that? No, that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, like I said, we as police officers, we can't worry about the judicial system. And I mm -hmm. think that's what happened, because mm -hmm. if I arrest this person who's affluent and has power and so on and so forth, mm -hmm. they're going to come to court with lawyers. They're going to have that dream team and probably get probation. Mm -hmm. But I could go arrest this person who lives in this low income community who won't get those protections and they're just going to convict them. And I don't have to testify and things like that. So the court actually, in my opinion, it influences who we arrest mm -hmm. because I don't want to get into this legal battle with mm -hmm. the dream team mm -hmm. <laughs> when I can just make these simple arrests yeah. and get out of boys at the department. Like, yeah, you brought in that gangster for some dope. Yeah, yeah that's great. But what about the white collar criminal who just stole $80,000 from some old lady? Yeah. I would rather arrest him. Right. You know, that's the person I want. Yeah. But if I bring him into the station, it's like, Murph, what you got? This is what I got. Cool, nice. Yeah. But then I bring in a gangster who's tatted up with dope. And it's like, when we go have our, you know, our, our we call it our third briefing. It's like, Murph, what you get? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's a good arrest. I'm going to go take my trainee to show him what the asshole look like. And it's like, but the white well, collar criminal is an asshole yeah, too. But that's, that's <laughs> terrible because more money buys you more justice in America. Absolutely. I hate that. I think it's one of our biggest flaws. Absolutely. But you're telling me that that injustice and that inequality works its way backwards and it affects our police officers' behaviors. In, in my opinion, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, because who wants to go have that legal battle? Who wants to go? Because. Yeah. Why it, take on an impossible task? It's not impossible. But, you know, when you're dealing with some good lawyers, they're going to attack you. Yeah. They're going to attack you from the beginning of the stop 
all the way to the end of the stop yeah. and they're looking for just some little discrepancy in your arrest yeah. so they could get it thrown out. Technicality. Right. But you go arrest this person, they're going to get the public defender who hasn't read the case until 30 minutes before it was supposed to go on yeah. and they're going to probably take a plea deal. Well, so, that's yeah. easy money, you know, and that's in, in my opinion, I mean, that's how it works. That's the influence the criminal justice justice system has on what we do out there. Yeah. Because there's plenty of assholes driving Ferraris and Lamborghinis and, you know, Bentleys and all those things. But, you know, how often do you see a police car be, be behind him with the red and blue lights on, right? Mm. Very rare. But so, Honda Civic. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't drive a 12 uh, year old Oldsmobile. Yeah. yeah. You, you get, you, I mean, you tell me how many times have you seen a police car behind a, you know, the fancy high end vehicle? It's very rare, but they commit the same traffic violations that everyone else do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and that's my perception. That's my reality. And I believe that's how, you know, whether we talk about it or not, the, the justice system does influence who we, who we target. Now, how do you think um, social service, I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but how do you think social service can work in tandem with policing to provide a better or more equitable police force or Envir is there a role to for increased social services when you say social services well, like when you look at like mental health because you're you may go into a scene where a situation where you're dealing with someone that has mental health is issues and you're not necessarily trained for that because i don't i don't and they may incorporate some elements of that but you're not you're not a psychiatrist you're not a psychologist or you're not a doctor so i'm wondering because i know when they were talking about defund police there were some instances where they were saying well, you know, police officers should go to certain scenarios, but some things they're not necessarily equipped to handle, handle someone with mental health or. Mm -hmm. So I have two thoughts on that. The first is the key word in that sentence is help. I'm not a health officer. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I deal with crimes. Yeah. So I shouldn't be responding. That, those are medical issues. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, when I started the academy, I didn't know anything about schizophrenia and paranoia and all that stuff, mm -hmm. nor should I, because that's not what I wanted to do. Those are medical issues. Throwing it in the lap of police officers, now we go back to education. Mm -hmm. When you require a four-year education, make that part of the curriculum. You know, we can, you can structure the curriculum so that they're, they come out with that degree, that certification, if they pass X amount of courses or these required courses. And part of that, if it's going to be on our plate, then make that course a requirement where you have to deal with the, the mental health aspect, you know, the psychology aspect. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're getting a four year degree and you want it in criminal justice, then part of the requirement is you complete these two courses in psychology or whatever it is. You know, uh -huh. I, I'm I don't know, but that should be part of the curriculum for that four year degree that qualifies you to be a police officer. I mean, think about it. We have all these powers to arrest, restrict someone's freedom, uh, use deadly force, but yet we treat this profession like a trade. Like, ah, oh, just go do an apprenticeship with this old salty dude in a police car and you're qualified. Mm -hmm. Imagine if a doctor did that. <laughs> you got to have a degree to be a doctor. You got to have a degree to be a lawyer. Well, if we want this to be a profession, make it a professional degree. So, you I you know, that's my soapbox. I, like I said, I get very super passionate about it. I think this profession should require a degree. Uh, I'll share a story with you guys and hopefully I don't slip up and say a name. <laughs> we can beep it up. <laughs> <laughs> but I was working uh, Cover City. Maybe I had six or seven years on and, you know, this female officer, she was new. Her training officer wasn't there. So they were like, hey, ride with Murph. Cool. She gets in the car with me. I give her the whole spiel. I'm not your training officer. I'm not, you know, grading you today. We're just going to go out. Whatever you learn, that's for mm -hmm. me, that's different than your TO. Just put it away, but make sure you do what your TO tells you to do. So I'm talking to her and it's like, what made you want to be a police officer? And she said, I just lost my job as a flight attendant and I needed a job. Wow. And here I am. Mm -hmm. I had to go to school and get, you know, four years of education. I got my criminal justice degree or administration of justice degree. 
I got turned down by numerous departments because of some bullshit. Like, wow. yeah. I, yeah. I I remember one part department rejected me because I they said I knew too many felons. Well, those were my uncles. How the fuck am I not going to miss my <laughs> uncles? You know, like what yeah. what am I supposed to do about that? You're at the so, barbecue. I yeah, saw you. yeah. Like, and that was their reason for rejecting me. And so here I had to go through all these, jump through all these loops to be a police officer. And it was something I always knew I wanted to do. Yeah. And here she is. She just needed a job, dog. Mm. She she's at in the same car I am, making the same amount of money I am without that prior education. Mm -hmm. She and imagine if she said, you know, I, I lost my job as a stewardess, so I'm gonna go take the six month course and become a surgeon. <laughs> that shit doesn't it's, it's comical right it's, but I put we just terrible, gave yeah. her all these powers to arrest to use deadly force take you know someone's freedom away you know violate their first amendment rights and just because she wanted to do it just because she probably was a tomboy at some point and mm. and nothing against her you know i'm not talking bad about women this was just the incident yeah. that she, made she, me she say she ended up being a great officer yeah right? this was the incident that made me say wow this is fucked up this is she's my peer and you know we didn't go through we didn't get the same educational experience yeah. we didn't have to jump through the same hoops and here she is my peer because she applied so so we want we want to increase the excellence in policing absolutely why why wouldn't you <laughs> I, I absolutely yeah i'm in <laughs> why would sign you? me up <laughs> yeah I, i'm all for it is there any, um, we spoke about the law enforcement for quite a long time. Um, is there anything that you wanted to advertise at all? Like, are you, is your coaching, your football coaching for youth, is that, that's through the school system? Is that? No. So right now I just do a lot of individual trainings. Like I said, I started off my junior year in college. I did a lot of youth camps and realized, hey, I, I like coaching football. So I just, you know, when I'm at the park with my kid and I see parents, I, here's my business card. I, I started off training wide receivers. I would only do wide receivers. And I remember my kids started playing soccer. And I had never, I don't know shit about soccer. I grew up in the inner city. It was football yeah, and basketball. I'm all about some hands. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> I started uh, watching him play soccer. And I remember I was looking at the keeper. And I was like, some of the movements he do, the keeper does they're equivalent to football hmm. so i asked the soccer coach could i and it, i i asked the soccer coach hey can i coach the the keeper and the keeper was just this little and we're talking eight or nine year old kid he's not stopping anything <laughs> and I, I started coaching him and this was the shy little introvert and i would say by the second week parents were coming up to me saying Terry, I can see the difference in what you're doing with this kid. Wow. He's much more confident. And he started stopping goals. He started diving. Even on penalty kicks, he would dive in the right direction. He would guess right. Maybe he didn't get to the ball. Mm -hmm. But his quickness, his reaction, everything started improving. Mm -hmm. So I kept working with him. And then I realized, okay, I'm not just coaching wide receivers anymore. I'm coaching skills. I'm coaching agility. I'm coaching quickness because that's the basis for for sports. I'm coaching the fundamental of sports. Mm. Then I start coaching a tennis player. And I remember one of my neighbors in California, he had a tennis court in his backyard. He's a great tennis coach. And I called him and I was like, Hey, what drills do you do with your tennis players? And he told me a couple of drills. And I was like, well, that's the same shit I do for football. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then I'm coaching this tennis player. She started improving. And I'm like, you know what? I'm not just a receiver coach. I'm coaching fundamental of sports. I'm coaching balance agility quickness and so yeah i i really don't have a business i i don't have a name i mean i i do have a future where i want it to go which i won't talk about because <laughs> there might be some more well-funded people who still my idea oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but right now it's just you know i'm like i said i, I want to build this in las vegas i want to establish myself as a, a pillar in this community i want to start coaching high school football and as this grows then yeah, eventually, and I'll just say I want a sports academy. Oh, so nice. I want to build a sports academy. So Wait, so if I want my nine-year-old right now to go to Bishop Gorman and be on the team, how do I get a hold of Terry Murphy? Can I, can I, <laughs> can I hire you for some skills training? Absolutely, you can. I'll, I'll give you a business <laughs> card, and you could put it out there. And but yeah, you just give me a call, and if our schedules link up, uh, you know, I, I I met a parent Friday when we were at the park. 
and she was she was just ready to give money to me. I'm like, you know what? Slow down. <laughs> How about we do a couple trial sessions? Let's get money your, right now. Yeah, <laughs> let's let's just get your kid. Let's give him two sessions. See how he does. See if he's interested in it. Yeah. And if he shows that he's interested in it, then we'll talk about finances and you know I'll train him because I'm not in it for the money. I love teaching. I love giving back. Yeah. Like I said, I took a shitty journey through life. <laughs> so anything I can give back to me, it's a reward. It's not. This isn't work for me. This, yeah. you know, they say if you do, if you love doing something, you will do it for free. Yeah. And this, that's kind of what coaching is. But at the same time, if you're good at something, you get paid. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would do it for free. But yes, there is a financial component to it that absolutely, you know, because I, I feel like I am good at it. And it has shown Yeah, uh, when we coached our kids or when I coached Tony's kid and a couple of the other kids, my kid was on the team. I had no desire to coach a second season. It was mm. like, okay, get my kid through this flag football just because, you know, they needed coaches. So I was like, you know what? I, I know a little bit about football. Yeah. I'll coach. So I coached the one season, and my wife, she started receiving text messages from the other peers like, hey, we'll sign our kid up if Terry coaches again. And to yeah. me, that was the best compliment I could yeah. get. Like, mm. yeah. <laughs> he, our kid wants to play for him. Right. So once I got that, it was like, okay, I'm in this. I'm in this. Hey, was the, uh, you said that, that soccer kid, the one that, um, that you, they, the parent or parents said that he had improvement. Was that kind of like your first test or was that? It was my first dive into soccer. And, uh, it wasn't my first test because, like I said, I've been just coaching youth uh, since 97. Oh. But that was oh. my first dive into soccer. I, I oh, knew okay. zero about soccer. I remember going to my kid's soccer game. And fortunately for me, there was another parent who played football. And I see the field like a football field, like how to play defense, where the holes are at on offense. And I'm like, oh, he should have ran a cover three here. But in soccer, they don't call it a cover three. <laughs> <laughs> but – I start seeing the similarities of soccer and football and how, you know, these kids can take better angles and get quicker and work in tight spaces and improve their footwork. So once I saw that, understood that, and, you know, it takes just like anything else, it's a learning process, watching videos, reading books. And it was like a lot of this stuff is similar to football. Uh, obviously, I try to make it to where it relates more to soccer, but a lot of the drills for quickness and speed, agility, they're all the same. So, yeah, it, it you know. So right now are you, um, is it mainly foot, you want to focus on football or, you're, I mean, finding kids that, kids and parents that need help in football Rich or kids. soccer or. <laughs> ding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I, I I mean, obviously, that's the goal because I, I do have a long-term dream. I, I do have to finance the sports academy. <laughs> it's a beautiful <laughs> yeah, building. Yeah, that's the long-term goal. Police so, pension. Yeah, yeah. That, no, that's that's for my kids. <laughs> that's not a gamble. <laughs> but at the same time, I, I just want to help kids. It doesn't matter. You know, I, I get like, hey, everyone probably can't afford me. Yeah. But at the same I do want to help. So... But yeah, there you know, there's there's a monetary value to it, just like anything else. I'm giving you services so, to me that have been proven over time, mm. and you're going to see the results. And you know, it's not like you're in some gym membership where you can't get out of it for a year. No, if you don't like it, you can go. So, well, I got a test for you. How come we don't see more slant routes in the NFL? Isn't that an easy first down? Mm. I mean, it's, you can't catch him. He's inside. Yeah, I, I think you see a lot of them actually. Like OBJ, he's a killer at it. You That's know, all it is, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, I, maybe you, it don't look that way because they're not <laughs> running it right. That's where I come in at. Okay. I, 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 you know, I teach route running. Yeah. Uh, but I think you see a fair share of slants and crossing routes, and yeah, I, I, I would disagree with that statement. Okay. <laughs> now, what is what are the elements of running a good route or just route running? If you had fast. to break it down. Because it's more than just a speed component. I mean, you oh, look absolutely. at Cooper Cup. He's not the fastest guy out there. No, and they'll tell you he's a great route runner. It's, it, it's a lot of discipline. It's being where you're supposed to be. It's, you know, cutting that route off at the top of the route and accelerating out. Now, when you say top of the route, what does 
Let's say so to someone who I'm doesn't su- watch football. If I'm supposed to run a 10 yard route, I got to get to 10 yards, make my cut and get out as fast as I can. Uh, I, I tell kids a lot of times, speed is great, but a long route in the NFL is 15 yards. You're running a deep route at 15 yards. For the most part, especially at the NFL level, you're playing within that five, 10 yard area. So it's not about just flat out four two speed. It's how quick can I get in this hole? How quick? That sounds preferred. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I was not thinking that Ooh. at all. <laughs> you don't have any comments on that? Anymore? <laughs> oh, oh. That's for college <laughs> parties, not for training kids. It, it, it came, when I heard it in my head, it wasn't <laughs> like, oh, okay. But yeah, that's what it is. Oh, you want to stay in the hole. You don't yeah. want to get there quick. Well, you want to get in quick. And, <laughs> yeah. and then, come and back then on yeah, yeah, work your way up in there and uh, st- yeah, get open. But that's what it is. How quick can I get in this open area <laughs> <laughs> and catch the ball? So, you know, I when I coach wide receivers, I tell them catching a the ball is the last thing you do. In order to get open, you've probably done six or seven things. you got to read the coverage. you got to pre-snap read. you got to post-snap read. you you know, as you're running, you got to measure, make sure you're getting the right depth. And then when you come out your route, okay, where did the linebackers go? There's a shift there. You know, if they blitz. You got to make an adjustment. So, hey, hey, Terry, did, did Joe Flacco win the Super Bowl or did Anquan Bolden win the Super Bowl? Oh, uh, I was, you know, that's the beauty of sports or football. It's a team sport. <laughs> Joe Flacco didn't make mistakes. And <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, I mean, Ray Lewis won the Super Bowl. <laughs> and, and Ed Reed and Chris McAllister, they won the Super Bowl. Okay. Terrell sucks. Yeah, that was those were the Super Bowl winners. But, yeah, when you play receiver, I mean, running a route, you got to be very disciplined. It's probably the most no, I can't say that. But you, you just have to be very disciplined. You have to be v- very precise. You got to be where the quarterback expects you to be. A great quarterback is going to release the ball before you get open. He's going to throw you open. So if he's throwing it to a spot and you're not there, and I, I always, you know, we watch football games, especially at a bar, and I hear people yelling, oh, that was a terrible throw. I'm like, no, I think he ran the wrong route. <laughs> yeah, the quarterback gets the stat. He yeah. gets the interception, but that was a right. shitty ass route. Right. So, you know, and those are the things that, you know, maybe the casual observer don't see, but when you see a Cooper Cup and he's always I mean, the dude threw him a no look pass. Come on, dog. <laughs> he threw a no look pass to a spot because he knew that's where he was going to be. So yeah, Cooper Cup is a great example. He's a great route runner and you know, that's to me, that's where you make your bread and butter. And it's not always the you're a four two guy and you can run great routes, you're golden. Randy Moss, right? Yeah. But for the most part, you know, you ain't got it. Four five, Jerry Rice. You know, just be where I think you're gonna be. Read the defense, which is most important, because now you know where I want you to be, and yeah, you'll have success. Plus Jerry was like fifty three years old, right? Hey, and you probably could still get it <laughs> in, man. Jerry Jerry's a cold dude, man. Jerry's a cold dude. So who's your top five receivers? <sighs> oh, top five. Obviously Jerry's up there. Uh Larry Fitzgerald. Gotta go with the alum. Larry Fitz is I I, I struggle with making him number one. Uh-huh. And, and and this is my reason before, you know, anyone jumps on me. Because he would be faster with less hair, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I say, if you took names away and you just were at the combine and you watch Larry and Jerry, Larry's faster, stronger, bigger. I'm yeah. going to go with that every time. So I, that's kind of my 1A and my 1B. Then I, I love Calvin Johnson. Calvin Johnson. Megatron. Yeah. That dude was a beast. Uh, I, I got to go local. My hometown hero, Keyshawn Johnson, dude's a beast. Uh, grew up with him, watched him become who he was. Uh, so yeah, he he's always in my top five. Randy, ah, uh, no, I too much nonsense. No, 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 it's not that. Randy's great. Randy's great. Uh, but I, when I played, I I like to think I played with that physical style, go over the middle, you know. So that's the type of receiver I kind of flock uh-huh, to. Uh-huh. That's what I like. So if I'm rounding out that top five, ooh trying to think I, I like Devonte. Devonte brings that basketball element to it with those releases and he's not he's a big but i like big bodies dude okay. man. <laughs> you're a big body receiver and you go over the middle 
I give you all the praise. So, you know. But then how do you feel about tight ends stepping in? Oh, Catching. yeah. No, it's great. I mean, shit, I played tight end in high school. I, okay. I like 150. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I started. I was like, hey, man, I want to be on the outside. But yeah. no, yeah, you. I mean, those are those dudes are freaks. They're athletes. You know, Gronk, 6'7", 260, running downfield the way you do Kelsey. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they're just big, glorified receivers in a sense almost. But I, I, I appreciate them because they block. Yeah. I, like I said, I, I tried to play a physical style of football. That's mm-hmm. how I, I was brought up. Keyshawn and I, we went to the same high school. So I was brought up under that that coach, that style of play, which was very physical. You're going across the middle. There, there's no ends or abouts about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to get hit. You're going to block. Uh, Dorsey High School, we always had a great running game. And you can't have a great running game if your receivers aren't blocking on the outside. So... I love to block. I love to get in there and mix it in. And I probably thought I was bigger than what I was. And <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I like the physical receivers, man. So a tight end is just as good. I I, I, I get excited when it, that kid that just came out of Florida last year, I can't wait to really the Falcons to unleash him. Cause he's, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he's yeah. a big boy. I think he's going to be a beast. Dealing with mental health issues or something like that. Wasn't it? Uh, I don't know. I thought he, I thought he might have taken a. I thought he took some time off. No, not the rookie. I don't know who you're talking Is he about. He changing his gender for Atlanta. Oh. Yeah, I, I think it was. I, oh, don't maybe, quote me. Don't maybe, quote me. Maybe. I could, maybe I could be wrong, but yeah. yeah. Right. But yeah, welcome I want to the me. NFL show. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, What is the um, your niche market? So kids between the age of eight to fourteen, or what's the age group, and what specific sports? So football, soccer. Uh, you know what? I'm still. I don't know what I don't know, so I'm still learning a lot about myself. Like I said, when I started this, I think my business cards still say wide receiver training. Uh-huh. Um, but when I started this, that's what I mainly focused on, and then I saw the value of just cross training. But the age group, like I said, I want to coach high school football, so I would say somewhere between that 8 and, what, 16, 17? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so – it's really just youth development uh, you know it's more developing youth mentally physically uh, having that communication with them teaching them life lessons and the disciplines necessary to be successful okay i you know i doubt if i'm lucky one of the kids i coach will make it to the pros but i'm really just trying to develop young men and women and women i've i've coached one girl football player one girl tennis player so yeah yeah all right, I think. I'm What's your forty pick. speed? Ooh, my, <laughs> my fastest was a four or five, and I pulled a hamstring. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I ran All the four out. or five. Hey, you got it. You got All it. <laughs> that was my last run yeah, of the yeah, day. Yeah. It was four or five, and I came up limping. All right, we're going to go into the final question section. No, I wanted to fix all the problems with the cultural divide with black America. <laughs> <laughs> you can't dive into that? Oh, we, we could try it, but we only got... I know, well, I'm kidding. We I'm don't kidding. have a whole lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> gotta get, that, that went quick. Yeah. I told you it was going to go pretty you fast. Did, you did. Yeah. There, there's actually a lot... I, I actually wanted to dive into some of that, too. I don't know if we'll ever be able to get you back for a second podcast. I know I'm you're... Re- I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would Sitting love to couch. talk to Terry more, yeah. <laughs> Uh, because I mean, the racism is issues that we have in America, minorities, blacks, Asians, white, like that'd be great to dive into and just kind of talk about whether in the law enforcement or just even just personally what we think about and how we to, can all do better. Yeah. 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 Community. Yeah. 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 It's just, in my opinion, it's honestly just treating people fairly with respect. Uh, uh, it's not hard you know what i'm saying it's it's not yeah. hard we put up the barriers we say this person is inferior this person can do this or this or that whatever our stereotypes and biases are we have those but you know i it's it's really just boils down to loving thy neighbor <laughs> really yeah. you know what i'm saying and uh it's not much more than that just you know treat everyone with respect and treat them equally and fairly and it, yeah. it, it would be easy if we didn't have this complicated history and current mm-hmm. inequalities. Right, and, right. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. This, the system is flawed. You know, it, to be honest, it, it wasn't designed for us. Yeah. It was, yeah. <laughs> you know, like I said, depending yeah. on your history in law enforcement, where it came from, I, for me, it came from the slave patrols. Mm. Hey, this dude ran away. Go get him. 
KRS One. <laughs> Co- yeah, that's where it came from. Are you I saying think. that's some of the origins of some of American policing? Oh, was, that okay. definitely is the origin yeah. of American policing. It came wow, from the yeah. slave patrol. So, and and that's you know when you like I said the cultures and traditions. If no one think about, it, there's police stations probably Midwest South that never had a black police officer. I mean, yeah. that sounds absurd, but when you really think about it, pull that onion or that whatever back, the skin back, that's how it is. They've yeah. never had a black police officer. Right. So how are you going to teach them? Who's teaching them about diversity? Right. Who's teaching them about inclusion? You know, the guy who was taught by this guy who was taught by you. Right. So that's how those stereotypes and uh, patterns, con- traditions continue mm-hmm. when you don't have someone in those when minorities don't have a seat at the table. I guess that's the easiest way to say it. You're, you know, law enforcement. Hey, I like to hire people who think like me because I'm going to have less problems. Yeah. Right. (laughs) You like what I like. So yeah, let's go out and we, we see the bad guy as the same. So, but when I hire this guy, he's going to question why we do this and all these things. So now I got to have answers or provide answers. I I don't know anything about. So yeah, yeah it, it's definitely a conversation that needs to continue, but it's just respecting other people. All right. Yeah. I want, I want to get you back if we can Yeah, yeah. dig into that. That'd be awesome. All right. First final question. What great daily habit or habits do you have? Okay. Did he just say first final question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. No, yeah. No, no. I, I got called on that part. <laughs> that was, uh, there are five finals. There are five <laughs> final questions. Okay, let repeat the question. I got stuck on that. <laughs> <laughs> the what, first of the five. Yeah. <laughs> what what great day uh, what great daily habit or habits do you have? Uh well. I, I can't say exercise anymore because I put on my jeans <laughs> this morning and I was like, shit, I got to go to a 40. 38 is, in, is fitting kind of tight. But I would say some type of workout routine. Uh, I've obviously fell off, but having that workout routine these days, I love cycling. It's low impact on my knees and it just feels mm. great. Headphones in and just go, man, I love cycling. It, it's funny. You do the Peloton or something else? No, I get out on the road, man. I, oh, I like the bicycles? elements. Yeah, I like Weird. the elements. No, it's for me, I wouldn't go on a windy day like today, but for been me. Here, been here for Vegas summer yet? Yeah, yeah. And I, <laughs> I, I didn't cycle. <laughs> Actually, no, I take that back. It was hot, but I will wait till like that sun went down behind. As long as it's not high above beating down mm-hmm. on me, I could deal okay. with the heat. Yeah. I love being in the elements, man. I, I love being outdoors. Awesome, yeah. Not in, not in like the woods and shit like that. But <laughs> <laughs> out in the sun, I should say. Yeah, outdoors. No. My, I grew up in the city, the concrete jungle. Um, I'm with you. Yeah, so just uh, exercise routine, which, yeah, that's pretty much it, man. Just being active. Awesome. Mm. Next question. What do you know or think of cryptocurrency? <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Yeah, I, I don't know anything about it. And it's just, what do you think about all the crazy news that you hear? I, I really don't. I mean, I, I think it's great that, yeah, someone is trying to change the market because for so long the market was dictated by all these other things that, you know, really who said gold was that valuable? Someone said, it and everyone jumped on it. So the fact that someone said, no, well, let's make this valuable. Mm. And now the market is changing, you know, like, yeah, why is pork bellies or whatever the hell? Who <laughs> put, you know, how, how do we get value? Just because someone said it was valuable. It's, pork bellies are delicious. Yeah, but <laughs> come on, man. Yeah, you know, someone just found the rock and said, gold, oh, this must be worth X amount of dollars. And everyone said, yeah, it is. I'll, I'll pay it. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm happily fine with someone trying to change the system awesome uh next question what's the biggest problem for humans and what do we do to fix it (sighs) biggest actually global warming i mean Mm. now how do we fix it i don't know (laughs) but i mean global warming you're looking at these storms that are getting worse and it it's i i mean i'm no i don't even know who studies that shit but it's just the weather patterns are getting worse. You're getting more violent storms further and further Midwest and, you know, snowing in Texas and where it's crazy, man. So global warmings, they're talking about islands not being here in the next five to 10 years because the sea level was rising and okay, let's say that happens. Where do those people go? So 
Yeah, it, it's, for me, it's global warming and trying to reverse it. I don't know if we can reverse it. I think that's why you see all those billionaires trying to build rocket ships. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> the, yeah, the, the earth is heating up yeah. on the inside and yeah, they, yeah. They, they know stuff we don't. So, yeah, I, I want to get on one of those rocket ships, too. <laughs> How can I get on one of them? Hey, if Bezos is going to the moon. I want to be right there with him, man. Freak it. All right. Next question. What's your favorite food or dish? Ooh, it, hard topics. You know what? Yeah, it, it depends on the day. I'm a hot wing dude every day. I'm yeah. a king crab leg, depending on which day you ask. Uh, let's see what else is up in there. I love lasagna, I, mm. which is funny because I hate pasta. But mm. lasagna is like different. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. It's in the shape of a cake. Yeah, I don't know what it is about <laughs> lasagna. But yeah, hot wings, crab legs, and mm. lasagna. Or, oh, sushi. Mm, sushi, sushi. Right. yeah yeah and I, i'll plug one of my favorite restaurants because i love it there's a place in beverly hills called ball sushi best sushi i've ever had mm. I ball? boss oh boss B-O-S. yeah b-o-s yep yeah. best sushi i've ever had so if you're ever in that beverly hills area la cienega stop by ball sushi tell them terry murphy sent you <laughs> <laughs> All right, final question. Terry supporting local struggling businesses. Oh, man. No, I, I love going in there. I, I go in there so much. It, well, I used to when I lived out there. I got to know the owner. Yeah. Super cool dude, Tom, man. And it was one of those things like the food is so good. How can I not advertise it? Like it, it's that good. And because we formed that little relationship and I, I was, <laughs> well, there's no, I'm, I'm retired now. <laughs> But I would sneak away from Culver City and go have lunch in Beverly Hills just yeah. to go to Ball Sushi. And if the emergency yeah. call came out, I'm hauling ass back. <laughs> <laughs> back <in your> zone. <laughs> but yeah, that place is awesome. All right. Um, last question. Shout out two friends that you think that should do this podcast. Oh, let's see. That's tough because... The people I, that come first to mind, they're not even nowhere near the state. One is in Florida. Oh, we I, we do remote too. Yeah, his name is Sean Robinson. He's, I believe, the founder of a program called Orange Arrow, which is designed to help youth get into college. Wow. Uh, nice. Just great dude. I think he would benefit from it. And I'm trying to think of who else. Yeah, I, I, I don't. Maybe there, <laughs> there's actually... I want to say my receiver coach from Pitt, he's the head coach at Ventura College. And the dude is just a wealth of knowledge. I mm. call him. He actually coached Ocho Cinco at the Bengals. Uh-huh. Uh, but, yeah, whenever I have football questions, I, I call him because he's like an encyclopedia. And I, I think it would be cool for the world to know, like, hey, here's this great mind at this small college, junior college. And. He's been there for X amount of years, invested a lot of his money into the program. I mean, granted, he practices every day overlooking the ocean, so I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hardship. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But he, he, he would be, I, I think, probably a good interview. Just to, if, if you want to talk sports and football. Cool. Which, awesome. Terry, thank you so much for spending three hours with us. Let's cheers. Cheers. Thank you for being a great guy. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Pillar of the community. Right. <laughs> <laughs>